Well, hello. Well, hello. Well, ho- <laughs> hello. I like that. I like that's kind of like a, I don't like a young blood cover. Ching, ching. Hello, <laughs> Kirby Hand. Hello. <laughs> Uh, welcome back, you guys, to Pencil to Pencil, your favorite pandemic podcast. Yeah, we were looking kind of crushed there. That was a weird... Yeah, you didn't, you, you didn't like that. that. Like, you're like the Neapolitan kind of, you know? <laughs> like the ice cream. Oh, you know what? There's a new fe- feature in StreamYard where I can move people. Look wow. at that. So now, yeah, it's definitely... We're so kind if of you like... just keep hitting it, will we trigger somebody's um, uh, uh, yeah. epilepsy? I hope, I hope not. I could catch another case. <laughs> Welcome everybody to uh, Pencil to Pencil, uh, brought to you uh, every Wednesday and Saturday evening uh, by our good friends at Graphicsly, who make and now Brett's under it. Clip there you Studio, go, Clip Studio Paint. See now you know how it feels, right? Um, <laughs> and also our good buddy John Morrow, who is the mastermind behind Two Morrows Publishing. Uh, the fantastic publisher who uh, makes Draw Magazine happen, going, going, along with other going. fantastic uh, magazines like Lego Brick Journal, uh, The Kirby Collector, and much more. Um, Mike, do you know if, if uh, John has any sales going on right now? I don't know, but I would. I haven't been over to the site in, uh, I guess, probably since the last show. But I think he was sort of perper- perpetually having a 40% off mm. for a long time. So he always has some sale going on, bundles, you know, things like that. Mm. Yeah. So I remember the last time I looked when we were uh, stumping really hard for John, he had like a Modern Master bundle where you could get, I think, like 12 of the of the Modern Masters for like 80 bucks or something like that. That looks real sweet on your shelf. That's modern ma- the modern masters would come over and tag, <laughs> tag your house for you. That's right. Mike Plug is going to like draw on your forehead. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sal will come over and make a big Hulk face on your garage door. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you know this feels weird. I'm moving you over here, Brett. All right. This 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 is how I like it. This is how I like it. Okay. <laughs> so it looked, like it, was, it looked like it was part of my hat. <laughs> Welcome back, you guys. Um, it's great to see you again. Uh, my name is Jamar Nicholas, Philadelphia, born and raised, um, and also cartoonist uh, and man of letters. Joined, as always, by my best bud and modern master, Mike Manley. Say hi, Mike. Hi, modern master. <laughs> and what also, letters are you brought? What is the letter of the show today? Uh, G, I feel like a Muppet. G and five. How's that? G5. That's right. <laughs> and also, Modern Master and Bombastic Brother of uh, uh, Bolivity. Did I make that Bol- up? Bol- Bolivity? <laughs> Bolivity? Is that how you say that? You could say uh, Oblevious. That's what oh. I used to say. That. Uh, <laughs> Brett Blevins. Tip, uh, sip of the red cup for Brett Blevins. How are you, my man? How about my beetle mug back? Nice. I like oh, the first, isn't it? I like the reverse Beatles. It's a Sericlub. I yeah. have. There you go. Uh, Did you fix it? Asia mm-hmm. Pacific. I have Asia Pacific cup. <laughs> Komodo <Hey>, dragon. <laughs> nice. Komodo dragon. Alejandro. Hello, Alejandro. Says, I wish they would do more modern masters. That was my favorite offering from tomorrow's. You guys got anything to say about that, Mike? Uh, if you pay John Morrow a million dollars, he'll do one just for you. <laughs> you too can be a modern master. I love yeah, it. That's right. Now, I I think there are more, a uh, planned, mm-hmm. uh, but I think like m- many small publishers, because of the COVID thing, and then previously because of the tariff war, the Trump yeah. had started with China, and they weren't sure whether books were going to be able to be shipped back. Um, that John kind of held off because he got chopped up in that whole shutdown back earlier in the year where he had to basically pulp books that were coming back directly from China. Mm -hmm. So he had to eat entire issues, several issues of things that were coming back. 
So I think uh, it takes a while to uh, for Eric. I know they just it was just a post this week. I think on Facebook about the Jim Apparel book that they'd been working on for years. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it's it. I think fans don't realize how much goes into gathering material. You know, deciding mm -hmm. who you want to do, asking mm -hmm. that person if they want to do it, how good they are at coordinating things and helping you from their end um getting the stuff doing the interview now in case uh, i think when they started the apparel book well, well jim's been dead years now so then you have to try to get reminiscence state, from other people or a state clearance and stuff like right. that yeah yeah and mm -hmm. i think um, uh also the older the further back you go the less of the old guys are around now to say hey do you remember so and so? Yeah, right. And, you know, you may not be, you know, so it's like an anecdotal. Anecdotal? There you anecdotal, go. Anecdotal kind of. Um, so, so mm -hmm. I know that that's, that's planned. And I think he probably has a few more modern, modern masters. But I think a lot of plans for people are sort of on hold until we see where we are in six months yeah yeah and just and, you know as everybody has can state to just you know the state of everything is up in the air right you know we're right at the cusp of back in the states going back to school and what that looks like could vary from that's, state to state that's scary i tell yeah. you I was, we were just down hanging mimi's graduate show and usually the last day, it's like an airport, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's in there, you know, people are crying and having meltdowns and, you know, <laughs> people are going around, you know, trying to hang all the stuff up. And there were like six people in there yeah. Yeah. and, and a whole bunch of the wall spaces were, there was, there was nothing. So mm -hmm. unless like some people pulled out evidently over protests and some other, uh, other issues, but I mean, it was, very strange to be in a place that usually this time of year it was just like a buzz with with energy so mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. uh and then the, then they usually would have the graduation then there would be the the public opening and uh, i think there's going to be kind of a like a soft public opening but not you not like the hundreds of people that were there when i graduated you would literally have like hundreds yeah. of people on both floors of the museum well the, i mean there's something to even be said by them deciding to have it at all right and you know not to get all into that but it's just like it really comes down to uh what your comfortability level is with things it's well, like so, we'll try, yeah. right like we'll try it hopefully people will come but then if too many people come then we have to deal with that also right well i think like a lot of the colleges in philly well the school is mostly virtual now. So yeah. the art school is mostly virtual. There are actually classes that they can't have because you need to be in the either the, the sculptural workshop or the print lab. And since we can't do that, those classes aren't being held right now. So uh, it's, it's a pretty bizarre, it's a pretty bizarre time. I think even at the offices for the publishers, a lot of people mm -hmm. are, can't have like mass, you can't have full staffing basically yeah. so everybody yeah. everybody is still remote mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so you know all all of that <laughs> all that to say uh you might have to wait a little longer for the next modern masters issue <laughs> so guys i want to uh get us started here today uh we are joined with the we're at our full power the flux capacitor is at, at full full tilt and we're hey, going to cross the streams. That's right. On okay. purpose. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Chris? Um, we're here tonight with another one of our infamous comic. Oh, hold on. You ready for it? I got some graphics. Comic art boot camp. That's right. Yeah, boot camp is coming to you today. Uh, and we, Mike and Brett, we had a really great um, response. 
to the last one we did where Mike uh, drew, uh, what do we really cover in that? Oh, it was from script to page. Yeah, we're talking right? about layouts. Yeah. yeah layouts. Uh, Mike, would, would, would you mind doing like a Cliff's Notes of what we learned in that episode for well, people well, who didn't see it? It's, it's up, so you can actually go back and look at it on, uh, mm -hmm. it's actually easier probably to find on YouTube than it is on our yeah. Facebook page because yeah. they don't put little icons of each yeah. thing. It's a mess. That yeah, layout but, a mess. Yeah. yeah, but uh, basically I talked about how you go from interpreting a script to interpreting, ter taking that and performing the magical feat of turning it into a comic book. Right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and how that is actually the most important stage of any comic is the layout part. Yeah, because if, 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 you know you can render it in any style, you can draw it in any style. It could be any kind of story, but if the layout is not, if it doesn't work there, then it won't work no matter how beautifully you render it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which touches on the elements that we're talking about tonight. Uh, about composition and things like that. Uh, and also, uh, Mike created <laughs> our new mascot, uh, Man Bun. Bun, Man Bun, Man, man, man MBM, something like that. Poor Man Bun Man. We left him uh, about to get mugged in an alley with a with a really unfortunate <laughs> Tinder date. So, right. Uh, That's what you get. <laughs> Don't swipe up. That's what you get. Should learn. What did mom say? <laughs> Isn't there a three? Isn't there a three dog night song? Because my mama told me not to swipe up. Don't swipe up. <laughs> well, you know it's funny that now we live in a world where, like, we all grew up with uh, always hearing from our parents and guardians, "Don't talk to strangers, and don't get in strangers' cars." And now that's what we do, as a matter of course. <laughs> We're living in very weird times, Brett. <laughs> Yeah, I'm well aware of that. I, so, I, don't know, I don't know what the swipe up means, though. I'm out of, loop, out of the loop on that. Uh, you want to you you uh, break it to him, Jamar? You want to show him? How to swipe <laughs> him? You can actually swipe one of us. Or you can swipe him up right now. So. Oh, don't swipe me up. See, swipe or no swiping up. <laughs> well, basically, swipe left, swipe right. So all of that is kind of like the new uh, way of online dating. On you have an app, and then if you like somebody, you know you show interest by swiping a certain direction, or you can deny them by swiping the other direction. Oh, okay. So you know it's a very digital world. It's, we like, live the, in. it's like the virtual hand. Please. Yeah, <laughs> the virtual talk to the it's hand. Like, it's like this way or. <laughs> well, I'm not a computer dater, so that's where I'm. That's why I'm in the, I'm ignorant and in the dark about that. So, so let's uh, let's go over some housekeeping before we get into this episode. Um, for everybody that is watching us from YouTube, hello, um, and also on our uh, live on our Facebook page, hello, or also on my personal fake 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 book Facebook, Facebook. Page, my fake book page, <laughs> hello. Um, if you're tuning in for the first time, just know we uh, want to make you part of the show. But I can't see who's watching in the comments. So if you want us to interact with you, you have to type in the comments. So I'll see you. Uh, and if you're lucky, I'll put you on the screen. The, I usually put people on the screen when they ask cogent questions that I can get answers to. If you want to cheat the system and put five questions in one thing, that pisses me off. So please don't do that. Just do one question at a time. I see all of it, even if I don't get to it, no tears, all right? So let's have some fun. Uh, but you know, another thing before we get started, I, ha I wanted to do some show and tell because a lot of the episodes we've been doing lately, when we log on, Mike is reading some sort of art book. And I'm surprised you don't have one in front of you today, Mike. Uh, hold on a second. I will have okay. the art book I was looking at earlier. I had put it down. Brett, what are you reading these days, art, art, art wise? Um, well, I tend to keep re re repeating the same things. Mm -hmm. I have the famous artist books, mm -hmm. uh, the Loomis books. A couple of things I found early that I love. There's one called Forty Illustrators and How They Work that I learned mm -hmm. a lot. From. Okay, That's a good book. is that a recent book or is that no, no archives? Probably the forties. Oh wow. Uh huh. Um, Marvel sent me my one comp copy. 
<laughs> where they reprinted the Dark Hawk annual in the uh, Oh, the that's what that is. Yeah. Would you even know that was in there? <laughs> I don't know if you would know unless you right. read the the, yeah. the solicitation. There's a mm -hmm. whole bunch of different Iron Man yeah. stories all right around that same time. Well, I brought guys, so I brought the show and tell. The the Oh, the tome, there you the go. Tome. Yeah, brother. Uh, this is kind of like uh, the cartoon <laughs> Bible right here by Frank and Ollie, the Disney animation, The Illusion of Life. And I got this in Texas at a half price books and put it in my luggage. I paid 20 bucks for this. Wow. You got a good deal. <laughs> yeah. That's I a think good deal. <laughs> this book is like what? It's like 200 something on eBay now, something like that. Well, is that, the, is that the original one? They did reprint it, and they had lost all the the uh, uh, original uh, stats, photostats, or whatever you call transparencies, I guess. So they had to actually scan a copy Ooh. of the book to reprint it. Oh, wow. What year does it say in there? Hold on. I'm still, trying to, I'm still trying to open it. Hold on, <laughs> Hold on a second. <clears throat> so the reprint happened when? I'm not sure. Maybe. The original was 1981. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's like a Bible book for storytelling. Yeah. And this, drawing. Yeah, this is the first edition, fifth printing, eighty-one. Okay, there you go. Fifth printing, see? I mean, that it was really successful. Yeah. But it was uh, expensive when it came out, as I recall. I had to. It was a big investment. Yes, the cartooning <laughs> Bible. I, 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 I posted about it this week on my uh, Facebook page because somebody right. had challenged me to post 10 books or whatever that were important to me and uh, mm -hmm. that yeah, I'm, my, I'm, gran I'm, my grandma bought that wow. for me in 1981 i have another one if you guys give me a second and also uh chris bailey wants to see some notes today you guys uh master animator chris bailey says can you guys talk about why you might choose a camera angle over another i see many people keep going back to pointing a camera at the ceiling or at the floor to be dynamic Cause it's cool, man. I don't know what this like them. <laughs> uh, to be dynamic without regard to the story. Yeah, I think that's uh, like a default thing that doesn't really work. I think to to do that with a camera. Well, um, I think people see the Dutch angle thing, and they think, well, when they were saw some part of the movie that was cool, that camera was at an angle like that. But it's. You can't have it like that all the time, you know. Um, I always uh, refer to the students. There's a great website that I learned a lot from called uh, A Thousand Frames of Hitchcock. And it has a thousand frames, scenes, from every one of his movies. Mm. So it's just like looking at it, it's almost like a big, you know, like a like a thousand stills. And it's a great way to study storytelling because – excitement is always contrast you know if everything is dutch angle then that's just normal like if every angle in a movie every angle you board is crazy then it's not crazy anymore that's just normal right? it's a batman episode <laughs> right. yeah 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 and, well, and for me to choose i mean the visual thing could be better shown i guess by sketching it out but i always try and figure out uh well, Chris may be talking about film too, but I mean in comics, I guess they're similar. But you, for me, I always try and find out what the point of the scene right. is, why it's even in the story to begin with. And then usually because uh, most of the drama comes from following characters, I try and decide who's feeling the strongest emotion or whose emotion is most important to link those that scene to the next one. And then the panel will favor them So or shot. So sometimes I think... Uh, usually down shots will set things up very quickly. So you can very quickly see where everything is, but they're often not terribly interesting just for exposition. So for exposition, you want to go in and somehow animate that with people's acting and have them do a little bits of business or pick up a telephone or light a cigarette or something. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, to me, I'm, if I just try and think about what needs to be in the story. And then if you think about it hard enough, you can usually think of a, a cool way to do that rather than just everybody right in the middle of the frame as we are tonight. It's pretty yeah. boring storytelling the way we're being shot, but we're not doing an area. Either, so. Yeah, I think what was it? I was trying to remember when we were talking about this uh, layout thing. 
I, I keep thinking it's Sidney, Lu, Sidney Lumet who said, point the camera at the story. Yep. And that's one of the things that you do learn going from comics to film. Because in comics, you condense a lot of stuff between frames. Things can actually happen. That you In film, you have to spell out a little bit more or else it would be real jumpy. And we're sort of used to reading comics where we kind of train our brain to fill in stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you turn the page, right, and you go to the next page, you could actually be going from day to night or, you know, one scene to another. And we sort of, the mechanics of reading comics are different than the mechanics of reading film or looking at a film because you don't turn a page, you don't stop, it's 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 you know the, the the train leaves the station and you're watching the whole thing so um i think one of the things that can happen too is that you can be an adequate or not even a great storyteller but draw very well and your comics will still work mm -hmm. where if you're a bad director you're a bad or a bad story person a bad storyboard artist it will have a greater impact in the film mm -hmm. because it's it's much more layered and it's much more complex. You know, it's moving. You know, you have sound. You know, um, well, film so is. I think film is totally a, a, a witnessing process. Where when you're reading a comic, you're participating and making things happen in the gutters between the panels. Yeah. So it. You know, like in a comic, you don't have the problem of popping, where if you have a right. character or anything, like where if I was in a frame in a shot in a film, and you cut to someone else who's in exactly the same spot and the same size, it, it's very jarring, mm -hmm. and irritating, and confusing. So you don't have to worry about that kind of thing in a comic because you don't have the juxtaposition that's being caused by time passing, mm -hmm. real time passing, and you having no control over what you see. In a comic, you can stare at a panel as long as you want. You can turn the page back if you got confused or missed something, but a film is pulling you along, and if you get confused, you're just lost. Yeah. Uh, Chris has a, a follow-up thing, which is more of a comment, than a, a statement than a question, where he says, Eisner broke down what certain angles communicate in a way that work for film and comics. But I wanna, I wanna maybe throw something at you too. So when you take something like this, right? So it's like, it's Eisner's list of shots or angles. And then you take Wally Wood's 22 panels that always work. And you start to create almost like a little bit of a Bible for um, young ca cartoonists. Does that limit you a after a while? Or do you like, if it's not on this paper, then I shouldn't be doing it, you know? Does that become a cheat sheet? that people follow and it kind of limits them? It I probably feel could. About. It could, I guess, if, if the artist uh, took it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I always take them as, as, especially in the case of Wally Woods, 22 panels that always work as a suggestion. Mm -hmm. You don't have to necessarily copy it for verbatim, you know, but it's like if you position two people talking like this, it's clear. You can then come up with your own, you know, freelance off of that. You can, you can, you can run with it. You know, it's like there are certain shots that communicate information clearer. Or, or in the case of animation or film, you know, if you want to have Al Pacino choosing, you know, chewing the scene or some pivotal moment where the actor's really acting, well, you can't do a down shot because you won't see their face. Mm -hmm. Right, it's like you would be too far away to read their emotion. Right. Mm -hmm. um, consequently, I found that over the years, and I think I've mentioned this before, that when I would teach storyboarding, the young student, the young filmmaker, or the young cartoonist was always too close. They were like right up on everything, mm -hmm. and what and what they are not showing, they are telling me what's there, but I'm not actually seeing it. You know, mm -hmm. and so it's 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 hard in the beginning to kind of almost like get outside of your head because you know what the story is you know what you're trying to tell right, right. but the viewer can only know that if you show them enough information they can piece you can 
you can be like you know crafty and give them the little pieces and they can all put it together but um you know one of the the other differences in comics and film is the amount of cutting that might go back and forth in a scene in a comic you might have a couple panels right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so the second panel there the over the shoulder right or the fourth panel you get those a lot in comics where you see the person and the person they are talking to right in um in film very often you will cut back and forth between the two people mm -hmm. what they're talking and you won't see the sort of the over the shoulder shot as much in film right. um so there's things that work because in comics you're also condensing time far more than you are in a film mm -hmm. there's also a trope that i don't know how common it is now i haven't really taken time to notice but it's a real common trope in old films for sure television as well we have two people having some kind of intense conversation and uh they're facing each other so you're looking over the back of one character and then the character in the foreground turns around and also faces the camera so you can see they're acting and the person behind them reacting to what yeah. they're saying which no one does in real life right yeah Total. you see that you saw that a lot on like old soap operas they would do yeah. that where they'd have the person making a face or reacting to the what the person behind them was saying you know? <laughs> and it's just it's just a limitation of the medium to compress the time and get everything in together I mean, both of these mediums have super strict limitations on them. It's not like a novel where you can take all the time you need and easily drift back to observing a scene or being inside a character's head or being an omniscient voice. So uh, visual information has to be uh, more pithy in order to, uh, you know, like if you made a film of us three talking at a table, for two hours and never move the camera nobody could get through it mm -hmm. you know it's just boring uh, i mean unless you were just listening to it for information but as drama it just doesn't work so you have to do all these tricks to make it more interesting i think what, yeah which is what they do on reality tv mm -hmm. and some of those shows actually even have storyboard artists so what they yeah. do is they have multiple cameras filming all the time yeah that's not reality. Reality mm -hmm. is somebody farts, somebody else goes to the bathroom. So, you know, all these other that they edit it all out, but they would have me saying something. Right. What Brett just said, and then they would cut to you, mm -hmm. Jamar, you'd be like, what? Well, I always looked at the creative drama, you know. I always looked at the Wally Wood thing more as a way out of out of corners, you know. It's like yeah. a jam. That's why it's called that always work because you're always, almost all of those panels are exposition. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, typically it's not a particularly exciting moment, but the information is important. So what those panels are really are variations of dull moments that you can make interesting. Right. right. These, are, these are ways to do it. Um, my favorite, which isn't on there that he used to use, is he'd have the shot of uh, Earth in space with two balloons coming from <laughs> it. Like the, the ultimate long shot, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Kirby uh, used to use that too. Yeah. yeah. I want to, I, I feel like, uh, I feel like being the black dick cabot tonight. I have a lot of questions to ask. Um, so with this, right. And let's kind of rewind this back to your teaching a class or you have a bunch of young, maybe high school students who are trying to learn comics or cartooning. And I, almost every class I've seen somebody teach comics, they always throw this down in the room. Is this, more advanced than we want to give it credit for. Like if you're t teaching a bunch of 12th graders about comic books, is putting this in here kind of like uh, uh, skipping past, uh, you know, go and collect the $200? You mean the, the, you mean the Wally, you putting the Wally Wood thing in, you mean? Yeah, it's kind of like, okay, guys, comics. Now here's the, here's the Wally Wood chart is already telling us that yeah i think I, I don't think you would give that to a beginner i mean he made that for his assistants sure i know yeah. but this has yeah. got this this gets passed around all yeah. over the place to, well, it's, a good, it's a good reference it's like the uh, the illusion of life sure i mean that's a lot to swallow for someone who's just yeah it can be work. first day of class read this by next week right yeah yeah no yeah so yeah. i think that, you know i think uh this is 
I don't want to discourage anyone, but I, yeah. uh, I remember uh, having conversations over the years with many people who kind of feel like a big part of storytelling is something that you pick up unconsciously growing up, mm -hmm. and watching films and reading comics and, and reading uh, novels, stories, and just uh, developing, because to be a good storyteller, you have to have a double awareness. So you are simultaneously the storyteller and the audience. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you always have to be thinking of both sides at once or you will lose track. I was really startled when I first started working in animation I met all these people who'd worked all over and with a lot of several of the nine old men, for instance, at Disney. Mm -hmm. I was stunned to learn that those fabulous animators were not good board artists. So they were more like actors. They could yeah. perform this scene and bring all this life and gesture. But if you left it up to them to time the sequences and point the camera where it needed to go, they would often sort of lose the continuity of that. So being a director is a different mindset than being a participant as an actor or a performer. Um, but a board artist really has to be on top of both sides of that all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, you, and in the case of the nine old men and, and, and the next generation of guys, they were cast like actors. So they were like, this guy's really good at, at, at female characters. This person's really good at drawing monsters. This person's good at drawing fire. You know, yeah. so they they were actually they were cast just like a just like a casting you know agent cast the villain or the hero or the you know the crazy person or whatever. Um, yeah. Well, the reason they're called the Nine Old Men is they survived all the changes, so they were able to go from the bouncy rubber hose stuff to th to really sophisticated things like the Hundred One Dalmatians. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Chris, oh, this is like the Chris is the fourth guest in my. <laughs> uh, Can you bring him on screen? <laughs> I have, have to invite him in. I don't know if he's set up for that, but if you are Chris, come on in. Uh, Chris said, and this is kind of what I was talking about. Chris says there was no way I could understand the design part of how to draw comics in Marvel way when I was in high school. It was baffling to me. So you know, kind of like I think. And, you know, I'm talking about this from the scope of somebody who is not one of us and is like, OK, I know this works. But I think the kids will get this because it's a visual representation of how comics can work. But I think a student could take this as, you know, more of a cheat sheet rather than, like Brett says, as something that help get you out of a jam on a page. I guess, you know, having taught young kids teenagers and college students. I think you <laughs> teach, um, <laughs> I think you teach people from their interest, right? 99% mm -hmm. of any student you teach is a hobbyist, which mm -hmm. they're going to enjoy it to a certain extent, but then they're going to go do something else. Right. You have that one or 2% of the, and then that person, will be interested enough to pursue it to the next level, right? And then you become interested in, it's just like, are you interested in hot rods? They're cool. Are you interested in making your own hot rod? That's something different, right? Mm -hmm. and so I think with the student, what I find is that there are people who have instincts and the people who have really good storytelling instincts are already sort of in at a at a slightly different level because they're you know when you see them tell a story i've seen little 7 year old kids at the 7 year old kid he he had it mm -hmm. he just he could sit down there and he could draw these stories featuring spongebob or whatever and he really had it you think like this this kid could really be you know a great storyteller you have other people that they're more interested in the drawing, they're more right. interested in the rendering, they're more interested in those things. They're not, they don't click with the storytelling. And even after four years of college, they're not going to click with the storytelling because what interests them, and I guess that's part of our theme tonight, is that there's sort of, I always, now I kind of break it down. There's renderers and there's storytellers and sometimes there's people kind of like in between, right? Like Kirby was a storyteller. 
everything he did his whole career was to tell a story. And then there's guys who are kind of are in between, sort of like Barry Smith, because he was really into that rendering, but he was also a good storyteller, I think mainly because he was influenced by Kirby. Right. And then you had a lot of image guys in the 90s who were really about style and they had a lot of energy, but it really wasn't about storytelling, you know, not or one kind of storytelling. I would like to ask a clarification from Chris about what he meant by design. Did he mean the design of the page or the design of the panels or, or both of those working together? You mean like as pure shape relations? The shapes of the characters and backgrounds made is that what he's talking about mm, i'm not sure maybe he'll he'll uh, step away from the grill <laughs> and type that in i think he's in his backyard cooking uh uh well guys i wanted to share one more book and then maybe we should get started uh this was another uh one of this was my master class and i was speaking of being too young for things my mother bought me this book when i was 11. Uh, this is, and Mike, you've seen me talk about this before. Oh, yeah, I actually have a copy. I got that somewhere on like a library sale or something. <laughs> this is uh, The Secrets of Professional Cartooning by Ken Muse. And Ken was a newspaper guy, and he also did a lot of work on, I think, the Tom and Jerry cartoons for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of broke down all of the secrets that I had no idea were a thing. Like it talks about a lot about dip pins. There's a hack on how to keep your ink pot from spilling over on your on your desk. <laughs> you know, um, talked about reducing strips in the size. I'm just I'm just changing uh, pages without looking. Um, yeah, you know what drawing at size really means. All of this stuff, and I wasn't really ready for this, but it kind of came back to me later when I needed it. And, not, and people don't really talk about this book. Um, I have. I don't think I've ever seen that book. Yeah, it's it's wildly out of print, and this is my second copy. I lost my first copy. Um, I think. Are we all frozen, or? I don't know. Maybe just. It's, I don't. I don't even see you anymore, Mike. I don't know. We're having experiencing technical difficulties tonight. It's probably, oh, here he is. He's back. There you we are. We lost you, Jamar. We missed you. Oh, sorry. I don't know what happened. The, we're, we're having a storm here, so I think. Oh, maybe that's what it is, yeah. Yeah, it's like really coming down outside. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know what you guys missed, but I was just saying that when I was young, um, I, I had this book and couldn't comprehend half of it. And I don't really see a lot of people talk about this book, but it's a really great thing if you can find one. Uh, Chris uh, was saying, uh, to respond to you, Brett, the flow within the panel. <laughs> I, I, no. just, I deciphered that. The flow within the panel and panel to panel, where JB drew gray shapes around the characters and backgrounds to show you the underlying graphic design behind the panel. Oh, OK. Yeah, um, I, I, I got that. Was, was, I Chris that. All, was Chris already into animation at that point? Is that what his goal was, you think? Uh, no. uh, we'll just have to have him come back on the show. Yeah, because uh, I, I did understand that, but I had already seen the famous artist books, which had a lot of that same kind of chart breakdown in it, where you were looking at the major way the shapes were taking your eye through the picture. Mm -hmm. They weren't working with panels. They were that. The famous artist books are about il single illustrations, mm -hmm. but uh, I could get what they meant. So, in other words, it's almost uh, what we used to do is uh, turn them up, turn the page upside down, and then your eye will go to the big lines and darks and shapes that are pulling your eye through the page, and it's just easier to identify it that way. Or study an art artist that you like, mm -hmm. turn it upside down, and see what they're doing with the rhythm and the balance. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I think that that was a uh, it was a way of tipping your eye through. I mean, that that well, that book is called How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. So that Kirby um, basis and inspiration for that kind of hyperactivity. Because as Stan used to tell his guys when he came in, think silent movie acting times 100. Mm. You know, I mean, oversell everything. So every panel 
you know, December is a great example of that where everybody's tilted or they, <clears throat> they just have a very simple line of exposition dialogue. The angles kind of like this, you know, and they've got everything's hyper. And so those shape patterns were to kind of keep tossing your eye down through the Z shape that the page makes as you read it. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, I, I, I've read that um, Mert Meskin, that's how he would lay his pages out with those eye direction shapes and then start drawing his figures into his rhythm. Um, so there's, there's lots of ways to break that down into a process. Yeah, it's, it's funny because really the how to draw comics the marble way is how to draw comics like Jack Kirby because Buscema took his naturalistic drawing and he like put it down over the, the Kirby's chassis, the Kirby engine, because all those compositions and layouts, the way he poses figures and broke his figures into masses where he would, um, Kirby would always do where he would layer. We'll talk about where you layer something. That all comes from Kirby because Basema was not naturally doing the stuff to that extent, but he adapted that way that Jack did, Kirby did that storytelling, and it made his own drawing much more dynamic. And that's what the genius of Stan was, as he realized that, that Kirby was the best storyteller. You know, he was really the, the guy whose, whose way of telling a story made the stuff so accessible to people. It was very easy. You would never be confused reading a Jack Kirby comic. You may not like his style or whatever, but you would never be confused as to what what was going on, and it would never, ever be boring. And he was also just hyper. I think the hyperness sort of gives an automatic feeling of intensity. It's like having the you know, loud, fast music is going to heighten everything up. Because Ditko was just as great a storyteller, but he wasn't quite as bombastic. I just have some Kirby collectors laying wow. around. Mm. Yeah. Let's love it. Yeah. Nobody sits still. No, not at all. But you know, and I was saying, I think on the last episode that, you know, I didn't I didn't cut my teeth on comics like a lot of fans did. So I learned about Kirby late, like I was a comic strip guy. But when I first started seeing this stuff, I was just like, I don't get it. But then like a like a light bulb goes off later and you go, oh, OK. Well, his work isn't, his work isn't pretty, yeah. but it's beautiful once you understand all the intensity of the, of the way he's interlocking shapes and everything. But on the surface, it doesn't have that pretty attractiveness of someone who well, you're younger than, than we are, Jamar, but, you know, when I was uh, an adolescent, the big guy was um, Neil Adams, so he has mm -hmm. a lot of surface glitz and glamour on it. Mm -hmm. It's easier to draw. Yeah. Initiated in, I guess you could say. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. The other thing that's very interesting, you know, and I posted some of this stuff on my Facebook a while ago, you know, Kirby came, came to doing that stuff, especially the more and more dynamic stuff, when he was doing the Marvel stuff in the 60s, even in the beginning, the, the stuff was not as dynamic. And you go back to a lot of the great stuff he did in the 50s, it's much more naturalistic. You know, I mean, he was always, um, he was never a boring storyteller, but he did a lot more straightforward sort of pedestrian stuff uh, at DC because that's what they wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that was sort of like their, their house style. You know, the Barry Brothers and people like that. Um, like the Challengers of the Unknown. Yeah. Especially the stuff inked by Woody. It doesn't get much more pure comics than that. You know, but, uh, you know, these these elements we're talking about, uh, you know, are the, the fundamental elements that uh, you, you sort of have to try to master because it makes your job, it means essential to the job these things that we're talking about, you know, mm -hmm. pointing the camera to where the story is, taking the time to tell the story. I think um, young artists are afraid of things being boring. Right. That seems to think the thing that people are most afraid of is this is going to be boring. This is not exciting enough. Right. Um, and like I always said, it's like excitement is in comparison. You build up to something that's excitement. 
you know, it's like a, a roller coaster ride. You know, you build up and then you go down. You build up and then you go down. And if you watch a film, like, you know, Indiana Jones or any kind of action film or a horror film, it's all about building up and then going down, building up and then going down. Hey, Cosmo. My dog is like, <laughs> he's, be, he's being real suspicious in the back. Uh, we can't have it. <laughs> I, I, don't, uh, I didn't contribute to the books, but I've got a couple here that so I would throw up. This is a. Yeah. Yeah. You can't go wrong with that one. That's gorgeous, Brett. Yeah. I mean, this this is a. That's a new printing, right? Uh, it's a reprint. I have. I yes. don't. I, actually, this is a dupe. I have this as a duplicate. This isn't the one I use. The one I use is taped together and falling apart. Um, but I got a nice copy later. But uh, it covers um, all, everything: color painting, composition, uh, everything you'd ever want to know about drawing. How to use photo reference. How to control values. I mean, everything is crammed into this one. Uh, the copy is a little meandering. You know, he, he writes as if he's a, a kindly grandfather bringing, bringing you along, telling you about this stuff. But all the information is great. And then this one is all about structure. Yes, that's a great one. Yeah. So this is all about uh, same author, uh, Andrew Loomis. I haven't seen that one before. This one is, it has some stuff, you know, about, about how to structure Oh, I definitely need that one. <laughs> and it has cartoon figures. You see, it's mm. you know, exaggerated as well as realistic. Aren't some of those in drawing with the pencil? Fun with a pencil? Uh, well, or variations. Okay. I think different illustrations, but he, you know, he tells you how to do everything with perspective. This probably has uh, most the most perspective stuff in one place. He's showing you here how to uh, work out a reflection in a mirror correctly, and how to wow. do the reflections in water correctly. <laughs> I mean, it's really fantastic and very clear. The diagrams are very clear. Yeah, people, that, going that, up and, that, people going up and down staircases correctly in perspective. Well, wow. how to draw a staircase in perspective. Yeah, all that stuff. So yeah. I learned a lot from this one too. You can, it, he has stuff in here about how to take a, a like a floor plan of a room and then build it up and set yeah. people in it correctly. And oh my God, I need that. I need that like today. I'm coming over, Brett. Okay. Well, they've reprinted this one as well, and so I think you can get a reprint for like twenty bucks or something. Right, or or it's all online. If you go to saveloomis.org, this stuff has been up online for since there's the internet. People did it, and uh, you can get PDFs. So, you, I think I, I would have a PDF, but I also would buy the book because mm -hmm. I like having books. Yeah, I think it's easier to learn from a book for some reason. I think maybe it's just the way I learn, so I'm very comfortable with it. But I, you know, all the students have been recommended to get this stuff. But yeah. those two books are mm -hmm. really essential. And, you know, every guy who works at ILM, every person who works in concept design or anime, everybody knows those books. Every Everybody has those books, which is funny because for so many years, for decades, those books were out of print, and people like me or Brett would be hunting bookstores to try to find your copy because everybody knew that those were the books, along with the like the famous. Art. If you only bought the Illusion of Life, the famous artist books, and those Loomis books, you would actually have to buy no other books. <laughs> You're good, right, <laughs> um, guys? I mean, other things can be. Uh, Going on a specialization, but everything you need to know is in those volumes. Uh, our uh, good friend Eternity Forever says, "Oh, that, that's not what I wanted to put on my screen. Sorry." Uh, are there any Kirby stories that are non-superhero that have the same feeling of motion and dynamics that stand out today? Like maybe his romance comic, maybe. He did a ton of romance comics. He did yeah. westerns. He did. Uh, there's also some really great little science fiction, short science fiction stories in the 50s DC stuff. Yeah. And, and, what the, and the, the demon isn't really a superhero. It's pretty cool. What about the one, I forget what it is, where he kind of did told his life story uh, growing up in New York. I can't remember. Yeah, that, that's, that's later, and that's the more stylized Kirby. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to like the mid 
early to mid fifties. Uh, he did a lot of romance, Justice Traps, the Guilty did police comics, and it's not the um, Fantastic Four, or uh, it's it's not quite as as it's not what we think of as Kirby, you know. Um, especially like this, the the Challengers of the Unknown. That's got a lot of great storytelling in it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know what's funny, everybody that's listening and watching, this conversation is exactly what having a phone call with Mike and Brett is like. <laughs> Everybody talks about this stuff. So this is really a fly on the wall podcast. What would it sound like if you were on a call with us? It's this. <laughs> Nothing different. That's true. Um, Been doing right. it for 30, 40 years. Guys, let's talk about tangents. Mike, you want to talk about tangents? Okay. All right. Well, here, let me get my thing first. Um, so if you – I'll share my screen. All right. Okay. I'm going to dump you guys, but don't go anywhere. Whoa. Okay, can you see that? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you All bigger right. eyes? Can you green button that? It's it's about as big as you can get. It's okay. you can't get any wider wider. So this okay. is a little I post this I think on my Facebook and I it's on my Instagram, but this is something that I made back really quick one day when I was teaching my storyboarding class. And it was called the little a little checklist that would help the student, um, because a lot of people would sort of go out of bounds almost, as I would call it. Um, you know, is your composition pleasing and clear? Does it serve the story? Now, again, this is the kind of thing you really get in the Loomis book, especially creative illustrations. He talks about a lot about composition um, and you know you want the composition to serve the story you don't want it to be weird or confusing again this goes to the crazy angle stuff that, that Chris was talking about earlier um, you know the, the, the number one point always for you as a storyteller is to tell the story and everything, it's like gravity, bends everything to tell the story the best way. Uh, don't crop important elements, right? Like you don't crop people's feet. You don't put people's feet right on the border. You don't uh, have things touching right at the edge, uh, like the, with the restaurant. Or where we're talking about tangents, you can see where Barney's ear is touching Fred. And, of course, this is the best drawing of Fred Flintstone ever. Um, and then uh, uh, one thing I do, I do stress in the beginning, and I was just coaching a student recently, buy yourself a triangle, buy yourself a mechanical pencil. Um, when you're making a composition, you have to draw a frame around your, your border, around your composition, all right? The orientation of your border gives you, uh, or the gives you the elements, because the composition is a, elements arranged within an area, a specific area. And of course, if you don't have a border and you start drawing stuff and it kind of like wanders all over the page, when you go back later, to say, okay, now I like this. Now I'm actually going to go draw my page. 99 times out of 100, the composition won't be as effective because you didn't plan it to be effective from the beginning. So all of a sudden, something that looked really cool, oh, you start getting other problems because now you have to sort of jam it into the composition at the end. So um, you do that right away. The first thing you do is draw the four lines to create your 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 panel border or the, the the limits of your of your 
composition. Uh, then it was like, is it good for your storytelling? Are the gestures good, clear, strong? A good gesture, you should be able to silhouette and tell what the person is doing. Strong line of action, which again, which means that the dynamic pose, you get, can tell what the person is doing. Is the uh, acting good and clear? Is the staging clear? In other words, where you have the people standing and relating to each, the set, are they on the set in the right place? Um, and then you ask yourself, can you push those designs? Did you explore more than one way of setting the scene up? Again, sometimes people just jump to something and they don't think, well, is there another way to do this? Is there another way to do it? And you can only find that out by actually trying to do it another way. And then maybe your first idea actually wasn't the best, but then you sort of, you, you will know that. Uh, then is, you know, again, perspective. Is your perspective correct? Um, there's really two types of perspective we use in especially in animation or comics but especially in animation you sort of have the regular one two and three point perspective or you have designed perspective which have the little thing there at the bottom where it sort of comes out of modern art and the idea that something far something is closer to you or something is further away from you and then you can play around with that because those little hills are not actual perspective right you no know, visually that road receding back over those hills creates the illusion of perspective that's not actual perspective right mm -hmm. um and so like shows like samurai jack or dexter's lab a lot of shows that are very heavily designed are really playing around with that concept of a designed perspective um, because of the overall design of the show means that you're not drawing true 3D perspective because the characters are more like uh, almost like a decal. They're flat. They're not three-dimensional. Um, so I gave this out to my students <coughs> me. something to sort of help review your work, right? Because some people are doing things that are very flat and graphic, which is fine. Yeah. Um, but all mm -hmm. those things about, you know, cutting things off, paying attention to your, your, your composition, uh, the elements of your composition. Um, I was going to show this here. Now, this is actually from the famous artist school, and I sent Jamar a link earlier. Uh, you, put me on the spot, why don't you? So Let me get, uh, let me we'll, get that we'll, for you. <laughs> we'll, we'll put that up. You can go to the Animation Union, the local 839 website. They have the whole book up for free as a PDF that you can download. And this is one of the pages that talks about composition and it is really probably the best the even better than than loomis and loomis is good but i think this this the pages there are even clearer and more succinct in how they break down the elements of composition um and uh so anyone who is seriously <clears throat> interested you don't have to do like I did, which was to hunt for that book or like Brett did. You can actually go to the Animation Union and download the whole Famous Artist uh, course there on uh, their basic drawing course, which has all of these elements of how to do uh, a composition. Um, so you can see how you break up the picture plane. And you can see how they started creating as you go down. Mm -hmm. You can see how they started creating interest in drama by how you just break up the space of your composition right mm -hmm. and again this is irrespective of style i think one of the things that students have to sort of decouple in a way in the beginning 
is it doesn't really matter how you render something, right? And I talked talk, talked about this in the beginning. People come in because they have style, right? We all love style. And when you're young, you're obsessed with style because you like all these artists. And the reason you like them is because of their style. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I like the way Jim Lee draws something. Or I like the way John Byrne draws something. Or I like the way Frank Frazetta draws something. Or I like the way Mobius draws something, right? And people love style. But underneath the frame of style are these principles that we're talking about tonight. And when you learn those principles, then that allows you actually great flexibility of style. Because one of the things about my career and Brett's career too, is when you work in animation, you work in all kinds of styles. You work in the style of the show. So not all shows are the same style. But the elements that we're talking about will be present in any show, any design that you're working on. Mm -hmm. um, I have that link. Uh, I just put it into the chat, but I can put it on the screen okay. real quick. I didn't want to. You were. Uh, I don't think two people can share something at the same time. Um, you can go ahead and share. With, is, this is what you were looking yeah, for, right? right? Yeah. And so, if, if you can, you scroll down on that. Can you? Yeah. So just keep scrolling down. So there you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me see if I can biggerize that. I I, I am biggin. <laughs> In biggin. Mm -hmm. See, that's a very interesting exercise for anyone to do. What if you follow the instructions and play with that? You have those three elements, but you can make them any size and combine them in any way, as you can see below, mm -hmm. and tell different sorts of stories, different mm -hmm. sorts of emphasis. Yeah, that's really cool. I have something here specifically about tangents, uh, Jamar, that you ask about. It's, uh, it's actually from Draw Magazine. But, uh, yeah, oh, hold on, I can't see you. You have, are you holding it up or are you sharing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't share it, I don't think. I actually have to hold it up. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Brett. Can you see it? Yes. It's really close. Yes. Uh, those images right there are horribly composed. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm laughing. I love the neck on the, on the second panel. Yeah, going right out of the tree. and uh, Yeah. You know, there's a million tangents, which means that edges of forms line up in an unfortunate way that seems to stick them together on the same plane. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an example of tangents that are rampant. And it, you know, I mean, something like the lady's hat in the tree, you would think that, whoops, that no one could actually not see that. But occasionally, the stuff happens, you know, I yeah. mean, and the guy's shoulder touching the edge of the. Mm -hmm. um, picture frame. I mean, it's very uncomfortable and annoying to see that stuff in a composition. So it's better to work that out in a rough mm -hmm. first. But that's an example of a picture that's full of tangents, a composition. I mean. um, thank you, Brett. Yeah. And also, I know I see with a lot of young cartoonists is they may escape having tangents in one panel, but the next panel down or across from it connects to the other panel with a tangent. So yeah. like like imagine there's like a car tire that's kind of cut off at the knees. And then in the next panel under it, it's the sun. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which kind of can would shift. Use the circle. Yeah. yeah, it continues that shape, yes. which is uh I mean I, I want to think that all tangents are by accident, but I think a lot of people don't understand. Well first they don't see it. Right, yeah. that's kind of having like a second or third level of uh, compositional know-how or wherewithal to know that things connect to each other in a way. Um, I think a lot of people who don't see tangents are just happy that they drew something. Well, you know it's, I mean? it's because they're probably their heads are inside the uh, the content, you know, yeah. about the characters and the stuff they're drawing, and not paying attention to it separately as a pattern. Yeah. Also. Um, uh, so I, I was going to show, mm -hmm. uh, to show how even the greatest 
artists, the most famous artists, have tangents in their work. Um, I was going to show some some examples. So uh, here, if you show the share the share the screen, um, this is uh, one of Frazetta's most famous, if not the most famous, Conan painting. It's, that's pretty severely cropped. Are you well, no, to show I just, no, I just blew it up so you could see, but uh, I'll, I can go out. But there are a lot of tangents in this painting, right? And one of the things that happens, like there's a just a lot of tangents. As you start going through, you start seeing a lot of tangents. But what happens with painting that you don't get as much in comics is you get you get uh, value and texture and color, and in comics, usually the 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 everything's in an ink line, so the texture might yeah. come in the way you render something, and you don't get to have hard edges or lost edges, and so you can see one of the ways for Zeta, even though he has many tangents is he has color, the color between here and the value and the color between this little finger and this hand, uh, between this and this, you know, between this and this, even though this jammed right on there, the fact that this is fainter and this is darker. Um, you see, uh, so, I mean, he's probably the greatest fantasy artist and one of the greatest artists of the 20th century, certainly the most popular. But if you go through his painting, you will find a lot of tangents. But I think, and I think actually if this was a drawing as opposed to a painting, they would actually be more obvious. Mm. Wouldn't you think so, Brad? They would also probably fix it. Right. Because he was aware of that too. Uh, guys, I have a question from the room, kind of mm -hmm. going back to Brett's uh, show and tell and talking about kind of comic book tangents that continue from panel to panel. Mike, you want me to close the screen? Yeah, you can close. Oops. Uh, okay. Uh, so JRD asks if that kind of continuous tangent from one panel to the next is, is intentional, is that bad style or poor education? From panel to panel, well, it can, it can actually work if you're trying to jerk someone's eye fast across the next panel. You can actually use it intentionally mm -hmm. to pull the eye. Um, but if it, the thing about it that's uh, annoying is when it creates something awkward, so that it like is a little bit confusing, like your uh, thing with the attire and the mm -hmm. two half circles meeting. Right. Uh, that can actually s draw attention to itself, which knocks you out of the story. But if you're just lining up forms that are connecting the panels, it can be a help to pull your eye through the page. Right. And it's a little different. I mean, I don't know if this, I mean, I'm sure it works the same in film, but and but we're talking about unintentional tangents, like you're not doing it as a storytelling device. Like well, it makes, actually, Yeah, I actually have something. Bring the screen up. I'll actually show you. Um, okay. So here's an intentional tangent. Okay. Good, good. I have this eye line of all the characters, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I run this eye line right across to the next panel. That's to keep your eye riveted and mm -hmm. force your eye to go over in mm -hmm. this panel so that you see Katia noticing something off site, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of a cheat. Right, but I wanted you to go from her, from the you know uh, Mrs. Daff to Heloise to Katia, and then Katia is looking off site or looking off panel mm -hmm. to see her mom. Right now we can't reveal; we're not supposed to reveal until the next day. Right. It, so this was from this week, right? So, also, there's a when you have a complicated background, yeah, it's really easy to have a lot of tangents, mm -hmm. right? One of the ways I learned from reading comics and studying other artists is that, like, if I had run this line in right here, mm -hmm. would create it. So you just you just stop it. Yeah. You just stop 
the line. Cut it, cut right? it short. Yeah. Right now, I noticed that that Williamson would do that. Wood would do that. A lot of the strip guys would do that. It also adds a little bit of what I call a sparkle, a little bit of air. Mm -hmm. if, you connect, if you connect everything, you kind of close it down, and it make can make your drawing sort of stiff. So if you don't connect all the contour lines, you just leave these little cracks. Mm -hmm. Again, it it doesn't freeze everything, and you avoid the tangents because believe me, there are, are always tangents. So Mike, I, I have some questions about these two panels. Don't close it yet. So right. and even like the 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 fence, like the horizontal line going across the fence is is totally drawing your eyes across that panel. Um, you know, it's kind of, it's almost like an invisible arrow pointing from each character to the next, which I think is pretty brilliant. But um, talking about like the hand touching the shoulder right there mm -hmm. on the first panel, uh, where this is kind of like a good, a good, I don't want to say a good touch, but it's a good tangent because you want them to be touching. Right. But, so you know, so the 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 lesson here isn't that you can't have things touch other things, but they just have to make visual sense or right. add to right. the story that they're touching. You don't right. want you don't want it to be confusing, or you basically don't want it to be awkward. Mm -hmm. It's really about things being awkward, like what Brett showed earlier. Um, the, the, all those tangents being in that painting make it awkward, or the drawing right. made, sketch made it awkward. Right. It would probably be a little bit less awkward if it was a painting. In fact, one of the exercises I had in one of my painting classes from one of my, one of my teachers was to make a bad composition, try mm. to make a bad composition, you know, put in tangents, you know. And in painting, you might actually create a tangent to create a certain amount of tension, right? Um, but in comics... It's it becomes a little bit more uh, distracting than in painting. You may create a te you may create tension in design on purpose. What we're talking about is by accident, right? And there really are in comics, unlike in painting, I would say in comics you really don't have happy accidents because you have to draw and sort of plan everything out. You're not kind of just like Woo, you know, kind of throwing things at the canvas and see seeing what happens. Um, uh, here's another, you know, I'm trying to connect what they're both seeing. Again, using this line helps focus the reader's attention. Um, and there's plenty of opportunity. Like you can have things touch, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I wouldn't want to touch her lip. Or I wouldn't yeah. want to touch her eye. I wouldn't want to touch her nose. There's certain, there's like here, I touched her nose, but not at the point. But right. I didn't have it touch her lips. Right. Right? Right. I have her hand go over, right? But I didn't touch that tree. You know, I left this little line open. And sometimes, you know, you're very conscious of things because when you draw it, after you train your eye for it, I remember when I first became aware of tangents, I was like hyper about tangents, <laughs> right? Um, again, you know, this horizontal line, you're trying to focus, even like the angle at which you draw the face might create a tangent. Like if this line were touching your cheek, mm -hmm. it wouldn't bother you as much if it's touching the profile. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The profile needs to be there so that you can see their expression seeing Katia with her mom. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this also goes to Chris's point earlier of where to point the camera. I point the camera at them, but I have to see Mrs. Daft and Heloise both seeing them. So I want to see her expression, mm -hmm. her expression, her expression, and her expression. <laughs> and then I try to create like a little frame yeah. to focus your eye where the eye needs to go. Right? Mm -hmm. And so... This is not in a super exciting, uh, you know, the Hulk punching the thing through the wall or, you know, some mm. crazy action panel. But if you study someone like John Romita, 
he was so fantastic at doing this on Spider-Man. That's one of the reasons why we love those stories so much. Yeah. Because he did stuff like this so well, as well as, as did Leonard Starr. You know, he was just fantastic with, with storytelling, um, with things that, like this, that don't jump off the page. They're not dynamic. You know, they're not an explosion. It's not yeah. a robot. It's not a lot of crazy rendering. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not sexy, but it's vital in order to tell a clear story. And I think that's something that you have to learn about if you're going to tell stories as a as a storyboard artist or as a as a comic book artist because, you know, you're going to have the pages where it's exciting and but then you're going to have the pages where it's not somebody smashing somebody where you can break you can break a lot of rules right this is uh intimate storytelling yeah and you you have to try to arrange all the elements the where you're putting the camera the angle of the people's faces all that stuff so that the viewer connects with what's going on right yeah. and when i was younger i would have felt like i needed to try to make this more exciting Mm -hmm. So I need to try to make this at a weird angle. Right. And I realize now that making it at a weird angle just robs the scene of the emotional mm -hmm. storytelling. But even in this, in the first panel, Mike, it is, it is on a bit of a tilt, right? It's just on a, it's right. like on yeah. a very yeah. right. slight right. angle. Right. Just not, yeah. right. You're right. Right. What I try not to do is put a box inside of a box, yeah, inside yeah, of a yeah, box, yeah. inside of a box, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you take it and you tilt it just 10 Two. degrees, 5 degrees, yeah. right, it adds a little bit of drama. Just like in the second panel, if you're below the uh, horizon, if you're below the, uh, the person, uh, it just makes it exciting without making it overly dramatic if you just lower the camera a little bit then it makes it ex more interesting angle but it also doesn't make it crazy you know yeah it's not a total like you know old batman tv show dutch angle kind of a thing right no that's that's really good advice and <laughs> that's great <laughs> right so like this goes to here this goes yeah. to there right yeah um, and again, you know, I'm using this to sort of go across. And now she's higher than them because she's more excited and coming towards us. Um, but even like the placement of objects on the table, um, all that stuff becomes more complicated, mm -hmm. right? Every time you do something like that, you 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 make it more likely that you'll have a tangent. Mike, uh, I have a couple questions. Well, one. I don't try. Oh, well, you oh okay. No, no. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> We're like production wizards over here. Can you can you put that strip back up? Uh, Eternity Forever had two things, but this was interesting, and maybe all three of us can touch on this. How do you know when to add texture to backgrounds that work well for clarity of story? Brett, you want to answer that? Well, uh, I think almost all of these uh, elements that we're talking about don't have one single answer that covers every situation. Yeah. So sometimes um, texture can uh, help to lead your eye, or it can add intensity. So, you know, if you've got, uh, I mean, Kubert, Joe Kubert's a great example of that, of the, especially like in the war comics where there's some huge guy in the foreground and his face is covered with sweat drops and there's all this double right. beard double and everything. And it really intensifies the emotion. Um, it can also be overdone and right. make it confusing. So it's really, that comes back to that uh, balance and design where you're, you're always trying to make it, or at least my personal theory is you're always trying to make it absolutely effortless for whoever's reading your story or looking at your artwork or watching your film. If it's a board, so that they never have to wonder, what am I supposed to be looking at? Uh, why is this here and not what I'd rather be seeing? You try and make it so easy for them to digest the information 
that they're just pulled along on the drama of the story. Uh, there's it. There is a fashion, especially in comics, to do what you might call stunt drawing, where you know you do a lot of super impressive rendering, which can be uh, fascinating to look at in one uh, context. But then you're talking about a different kind of experience where you're just sort of admiring the skill of the artist. It's it's like a dazzling effect. Mm -hmm. but it can actually slow down the absorption of the story because you know. I mean, this is a little bit simplistic, but the more lines and marks there are, the longer it takes to digest that image. Mm -hmm. If you want something to move fast, you keep it clean and simple. And then you can use texture to actually slow down someone and make them look at a scene. Like right. if you want them to slow down and observe the setup or really get the atmosphere of whatever, you know, a, a forest with twisted trees and a rotting haunted house. You want them to stop and sort of enjoy the mood of this thing before you go in and start carrying them through the drama. Um, right. So all of these things that we've been talking about tonight and many, many others, uh, what's fun about doing this uh, job, if you have this broad attitude about all the little elements you can play with, and it's like playing a giant multi-level keyboard like Captain Nemo at his theme yeah. Yeah. <laughs> organ, you know, where you can accent this and downplay that and punch this up, lower this, make this quiet, bring this up and throw it in your face. It, you can control timing, you can control intensity um, just by playing with all these elements. And the thing about um, you know doing this for a living and doing it constantly all the time is that no matter how similar stories are, and all most stories are similar in structure, you have to meet the characters, find out a little bit about them, set up a conflict or a problem, then they begin to deal with it. So there's a lot of similar structure to most stories but they're all different enough in terms of character or background or environment or sometimes mood that every story has a whole new set of problems that you can play this tune a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I guess uh, the going back to the Wally Wood thing, what that was useful for was always finding a transition. It's like a chord progression that always works in a mm -hmm. song. And you can get to the next, you can get to the chorus, or you can get to the refrain, you can get to the instrumental break. This will always work if you're in a jam. Yeah. You know, but the, those kind of the ways you can use that, that idea. Of these are uh, infallible ways to take care of this bit of information. And, you know, you can accent it with any level of intensity that you want. Um, but I would say that, you know, the texture question is really, if you want someone to really look at that part of your picture for a little bit longer than the clean shapes, then add as much as you think it needs in order for it to do that. Mm. I mean, none of these things are separate either. Like text right. is not something that you, you know, pull off the shelf and stick in. It's there to serve a purpose. Right. So, and also, and Mike, I'm, you know, I'm sure you have a lot to say on it. But just thinking about the information at hand is trying to keep the characters um, spatially active in the environment they have created for it, right? Uh, so, like, we get in, in these panels that they're out in the backyard because of the fence and the trees and the houses in the background. So like the second panel details shows like the lattice, right? The lattice work in the background, which still keeps us grounded. I mean, Mike could have easily in that second panel just blacked everything out behind her, which would change the mood of it, mm -hmm. right? It would change the mood of it from just kind of like a um, nosy neighbor surprise reaction to menace if the whole thing was blacked out behind her, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and so, and also just because that's so close, it would seem to be a cheat if he didn't put anything behind it, <laughs> right? Right, right. right. As right. you see a lot of people, especially- well, I, like also, in, I also, I also- Well, I think it's also important to distinguish- no, I was going to say- between, uh, between black used it as lighting right. and used as a local color. Because, for instance, if he had made the left, well, as, as I'm looking at it anyway, it would be her right eye, but the left of the picture past the lattice work. Yeah. If he had made that black, it could have just been a shadow. Sure. But if he had done uplighting on her, then that would have added that element of menace. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's two different ways to use it. 
You know, it's like this. It's like the dots on her pajama bottoms or whatever. They don't add menace, but they add a visual pop because of their graphic quality. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. So, so one of the things you're faced with uh, problems to solve because of comic strips is that they're reproduced small in the paper. So number one, I'm thinking about reproduction. I'm not thinking about, I have to always consider that whatever I'm doing is going to be reduced, you know, maybe 50%, right? Um, so I think of texture, right? So the lattice work I put in the background in the previous week because it added some interest to a wall and was also something that I would easily tell us that that was on the side that Mrs. Daff was on. And on the side that Katie was on, there was no mm -hmm. uh, trellis or lattice, right? right? Um, the same way with the trees, a little bit of texture. Um, it was a way of sort of focusing your eye mm -hmm. and adding a little interest and also adding depth. So uh, since there's not, we're not in a dramatic lighting situation because it's like a sunny day outside. Right. Now, I could have drawn this and rendered it with a lot of shadow and half tone, but I don't think it would be as effective for the storytelling, especially once it was reduced. Right. So I'm thinking of the lattice in the second panel as a way of adding depth, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like a texture, right? So that yeah. texture adds depth, just like the texture there behind her adds depth, just like these. So you have this texture and that texture. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Right. So it's not a lot, just enough, right? Just enough, like this texture, right? Just enough. Little bits of texture here, just, just, just enough. Just a little bit of here, just enough, right? Mm -hmm. Again, because I want you to focus on the characters and not focus on like, wow, look at that tree. That's an awesome. <laughs> tree right. you know i've never seen a tree you know i could have like gone in and put all kinds of detail and like put extra leaves and drop shadows from the leaves and, and then what would happen is you would be looking at the tree right right as it is you go right here because it's right. she's got the dark hair anyway and you go right there so right. part of it is is being is coordinating everything right? mm -hmm. um and you're coordinating to make the story clear and interesting and you want the eye to go where you want the you know you want the, the viewer to, I, I don't want to have anything with these four strips that would, that would distract what the viewer would be getting right the importance of the reaction of the characters to each other in this moment which has been building in the strip for a long time since last year beginning of the story started when it was in another story last year so this is a big moment when they finally meet each other right mm -hmm. so um i think it's important to know about doing this stuff i'm going to show this so this the great rockwell sold for like almost 50 million dollars all right probably bought by spielberg um but this is a master class in composition. And there are so many elements in this. Um, and, you know, he spent a lot of time composing every one of his covers. Would do multiple takes, shoot photographs, do sketches. He spent a lot of time. Sometimes he would do multiple drawings. One of the things that people aren't really paying attention to first when you look at it, because we're so focused on this, like this mm -hmm. right here, right? It looked real. <laughs> look at the angle of this table. Right. Why would that table be turned to that angle in 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 a restaurant like that? That doesn't yeah. even that doesn't like kind of make sense. But because he's doing that, you get this real stillness here. Mm -hmm. Look how beautifully all these elements are composed. The hands, the cigarettes, the way the hand reads, the way that hand reads. His face, his face, where everything is cropped, the angle everything is turned to. 
uh, you know, you would think, oh, this is going to create a tangent, but because he highlighted uh, yeah. the kid's hair, you avoid that, mm -hmm. right? But look, the, and he that, also, was, that also links them together as uh, emotionally. Yeah. Right. You know, and so there's nothing here that is an accident. Right. Nothing here that is, look at how everything is. And he's a guy, going back to that famous artist uh, thing we were showing, page showing, if you could take this and you could cut this out out of construction paper, you mm -hmm. could cut each one of these shapes out and lay it on so that it reads. And he was a genius at being able to do that. He was That's a gorgeous. genius at being able yeah. to do that, right? Yeah. You, know, you you are not, you know, this beautiful texture, all these, this texture versus this texture. You read this so clearly as an umbrella, a hat mm -hmm. going over. You read, look at how much of this you read of the guy carrying that tray. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit, and you still read it. Right. Right. This guy holding, you don't even see all the umbrella, just enough that you read it. Mm -hmm. Right. Everybody's eye going right, right here. And then this beautiful and cover even it, outside the window. And even the guy's elbow, the busboy, kind of points back to the table. Like, it's yep. a, it, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that I advise students to do is to study artists like this who are so good with composition, even if you don't like the style. Right. right? That's a real hard thing for people to do in the beginning is to learn to study things even if you don't like the style because they're, it will be really good for something else. In general, when we're younger, we tend to like to eat the same thing visually all the time, right? And then as you grow, you hopefully you widen your taste. Um, and so I think he's just, just a genius of composition, you know, and, and the use of... of of space in the use of of shape um it just it is amazing what he can do and then i had these so i was gonna so here's another frazetta his early conans and again all these beautiful shapes yeah right and his classic pyramid composition but you know even when they overlap see that's the other thing you can overlap something Right, like these, these overlap, but you could cut this out like a sh like a like a, a piece of cardboard or mm -hmm. construction paper, and you could lay this on top of this and then cut this as a background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's a, you know, and Neil Adams is one of my gods when I was uh, when I was younger, but this has many weird tangents in it the way the fingers are all kind of touching in here and then the way like his edge of his laser beam touches the edge of the arm um you know it's still exciting because of the angle and his you know bravura drawing um but this is an example of where you've got like weird tangents mm -hmm. that like that hand could have been posed, I think, better. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and here's a gym covered by Jim, right? Mm -hmm. Tangent. Tangent. Not his it. fault. Not his fault, but tangent, right? Mm -hmm. All these weird tangents, you know, by the person who laid this cover. I mean, where you put Jim's name touching the cape, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 you try to go over something, right? So I think this would be more effective if the hand was away. It looks more powerful. Right. Or more of an overlay. Right. Like that ear, since they're both dark, kind of merged together. So yeah. should he been scooched over a little bit? Would make right. it a little bit more clear, right? So right. you want to you want to overlay Here's a great panel by <laughs> Atomo. Yeah, look right. At yeah. Look at how beautiful. Look how how beautiful. God, look at that man. 
And again, we're not talking about style because his style, his, Jim's style is not the same as that. It's not yeah. the same as Rosetta, yeah. right? But all these shapes, you go <laughs> right to him. Oh, uh, bug it. I love this stuff, man. How can you not love this? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Mike, go back to the Jim Lee bit uh, uh, for, real quick. So speaking of tangents, if we, if we kind of just talk about Batman's ear and Wonder Woman's boot and how you see how that negative shape is created, that triangle right there from the tangent. Which is almost the same size as the ear. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like they, it doesn't, yeah, you're creating visual noise where it doesn't need to be. That's the thing with negative space, right? And when you're using negative space, it should work with again with the composition, not against it. Right. So. so I mean, sometimes it's just like a little thing, right? I'm a very obsessed with that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And here's, you know, a great toth page. Um, see how he overlaps? He could have just touched it. He just boink. He pops right over. He pops over. Um, when you're doing civilian stuff, I'll tell you, it's really easy to, whoop, it's really easy to have tangents with people's faces and hands and telephones and people sitting at tables and chairs, you know, the way this guy's sort of like half sitting on the chair, but you can still read the girl's face. Now, one of the things that he was really good at doing Again, you can blow it up a little bit more. Yeah. He would just leave those lines open. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He would just leave, he would just not close the form. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that helps create space there. Right. Yeah. Um. Here's a great. With some Felix, Felix, nice. yeah, um, man. These are great strips. Again, look how beautiful <laughs> you read all these shapes and textures uh, against each other, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, this is like where a lot of the anime guys started with stuff like this at Disney with these really simple, clear, clean shapes, mm -hmm. right. I love that. And I also love the hatching on the shadow. That's great. Right. Yeah, no, I love those old Felix. You know, and here, <laughs> and here's the king, mm -hmm. right? Beautiful shape upon shape. You could actually cut each one of these people out, you know? So his, his, he, even though his drawing is, is stylized and distorted and pushed, all the elements that we're talking about that are going on here are going on in this Otomo. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. And even at this, like the zip on the Otomo page, isn't the only thing that's making that work. Right. It's not like the right. zip. Is, well, if it was it, just the zip. Right. Yeah, right. It's not, it's not the whole cheat is the composition is what's doing the heavy lifting there. Right. Mm -hmm. Here's a Naruto page. I know, again, a lot of people are coming at this from anime or manga. So they're not looking at any of the older artists. They're not going to be looking at Felix. They're not going to be looking at Kirby. They're not going to be looking at Toth. Mm -hmm. They're going to be looking at uh, mostly manga and anime. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see he's employing the same... Some of the same things of where he's having a line touch, where he's leaving stuff open. Yeah. Uh, you can really see it down here on this bottom panel. Your eye flows, and then he's breaking the form, right? Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't touch it all. Again, so he's trying to avoid creating all these tangents. Mm -hmm. He's trying to avoid creating tangents. What's that last panel? That's, oh, okay. Yeah. 
Now, again, you could render this like Alex Toth, or you could render it like Jack Kirby. You can change these. Uh, you can change this stuff around. Uh, here's another great Toth page. Um, and he sort of had different phases. Like this is like his middle busy phase. I always sort of think of it as. Mm -hmm. um, but look how clearly, again, you read everybody's pose. Um, almost like everything is pointing, mm -hmm. stressing. All those lines are stressing. I love and then that. He, he always did was a great letter or two. I mean, that's just. Mm -hmm. I love at the bottom of the first panel the boot, the way yeah. the, the the spotted black of the boot goes right along with the drapery. Here's another, and I love you know they, these things as a kid, um, but there's a lot of little tangents in this, mm -hmm. you yeah. know. Um, yeah. I tend to think. Like there's like that. That's just a very odd tangent. And what happens sometimes too is when you draw it, it won't be as apparent for two <laughs> reasons. One, because it's not inked, and there's yeah. a variation to the line weight. Like when we were looking at the Frazetta thing, is there's a variation of tone, right? And then when you ink it, you go, oh yeah, like Captain America's nose is touching right on the edge of that, right? Mm -hmm. Or this. Things going right on the edge, and it's almost like if you just nudge things one way or the other. Um, right. That particular one is so full of tangents that I wonder if he was even trying to follow someone else's layout. I mean, this one, this one is like a textbook of finding tangents forever. Right. Right. And then um, there's also just the the complication of trying to fit all these characters in. Right. 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 But That's where. Kirby was so brilliant because he was so based in shape. He was always thinking about the design of his whole picture. I have a, I, when Mike was talking about that Rockwell thing, I had something else I would like to put up. Mike, I'm okay. going to give Brett the screen. Okay. Um, I don't know how hard this is to find now, but this book, uh, this takes a little bit of backstory. Um, when the famous artist school started, originally it was individual volumes by the 12 founding artists. And then they found out right away that they were way too advanced for most students to handle. So they created a general set of textbooks. But this is Rockwell's volume that was later reprinted as this book. So it's literally a textbook hmm. on how he works. Wow. How he works out his compositions. Let me see if I can find an example of that. And I, it's probably a little bit hard to find, but uh, I found a copy within the last year or two. Yeah, I mean it's around. I mean this is added as a, the original one didn't see. It shows how he works out his all of his poses, working with his, uh, you know, ver the variety of choices that he had. And, um, I mean, it's got a lot of charts in it where he breaks down types, and you know this particular one is showing how knowledge of the skull helps get every angle on the different characters he has to put in. Mm, look at that, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a great book. And like Mike said, this guy was so good at every aspect of it. That it you know, he's working out his compositions here. Ooh, I can't ever get this to work right. <laughs> is, that wow. is that Shimp Howard, it looks like? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that's... Uh, and fine. This is another indispensable book. That's good stuff, Brett. Um, what I find really interesting about all of this, and Tim Fielder has a really good comment I'm going to put on the screen in a second, is that even uh, students of the art form who enjoy, say, the energy of a Jim Lee page or uh, something like that, usually can't put a finger on what why it works for them or why it's cool. Or if you ever ask a 12 year old why something's cool, they go, I don't know, it's, I just like it. Kind of like the Apple Jacks commercial. We don't know, they don't taste like Apple nor Jack, but we still enjoy it. <laughs> uh, like all of this story, all the stuff we're talking about is basically one of my oldest analogies about a wristwatch. You put a watch on and it tells you the time but not everybody wants to know how the gears work. 
So if you take the little face off and expose all those gears and little ticky, clicky, clocky things, a lot of people lose interest because that's not what they care about. They just want to know when the next train's coming. So to go this deep, into the well on this kind of stuff. You'll see that some people might, even if you're a fan of this stuff or you want to be a comic book artist or all the other kind of stuff, might start to glaze over. Because it's just, in a way, it's too much, <laughs> right? This deep dive kind of separates the, the enthusiast from people who really want to learn how to do this, if that makes sense. But well, nobody really good. Far, yeah, you can also choose how far you want to go because you can stay functioning on a very... A sim simple and surface level. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of popular stuff that strikes an audience because it's hitting the lowest common denominator. Mm. So there's um, no effort required on the part of the viewer to really understand it in any way other than exactly what you see the first time you look at it. Like mm -hmm. some of the elements that we've been pointing out here are slower to digest, and as your own taste develops, you begin to appreciate the other layers of information that you are being given if you choose to, to delve into them. Mm -hmm. So it, I think part of it is, you know, everybody starts out with a very surface idea because that's all you can grasp when you're a kid. Right. And then the deeper you want to go, you find more and more areas to play with and solve problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a good way of looking at it, Brett. Mike, were you going to expound on that? Um, yeah, I think that, um, Everybody who's really good, they all dive deep. You don't, don't, you don't, you know, you can only go to the level you're capable of, right? You go down nine feet, you know, and then the next time, uh, you go 10 feet. Uh, like, you don't absorb all this at one time. I, I generally tell people that becoming a, a sort of a mature artist where you sort of maybe kind of have all this under your belt it's 10 12 years yeah it's like four people go to art school for four years but that's like 12 yeah. weeks of basic training that's like the sergeant yelling at you you know what's your major malfunction right yeah, and making yeah. sure that you, you jump out the back of the helicopter you know put you know blow your head off get your guns put together wrong right or right. you've got the safety off but really, you don't you don't do it in four years. You know, you don't do it. The earlier you're, you're aware of any of these elements we're talking about, the better off you are, right? Like some of them, like I had the Marvel comic book when 77, when it came out, I was 16. Mm -hmm. But there was nothing about tangents in there, right? No. There was no like, you know, and now tangents. You know, there was nothing, right? So I don't I remember. Might have, might have talked about trying to find clear posing. Right. But I mean, like tangents where the things are meeting or whatever. Yeah. I don't think that, that I learned about that probably until I was at least in my late teens or early, my early 20s kind of a thing. Because that's mm -hmm. like a, that's like a, that's first you're just trying to figure out how to draw and draw like the people you love. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, maybe you're figuring, trying to figure out storytelling and you're doing your samples, right? And you're trying to learn perspective and you're trying to learn anatomy and you're trying to learn how to ink. You know, you're trying to learn how to all to do, you know, it's like being a triathlete, right? You've got to learn all these different things, right? And so sometimes it's very common while you're working on one thing, it screws something else up or you kind of drop the ball on the other thing. That's why I always say I never lie to my students or anyone who's serious about this. But you figure it takes 10 or 12 years, mm -hmm. just like a medical doctor, to really get it. Now, there is always the person who's the super learner. The savant, right? I never met any of those people. I hear there's a rumor that those people existed. Everybody I know worked really hard. And then once you get, you can, you can incorporate these elements that we're talking about like learning your perspective, being aware of the elements of design, how to be strong with design. And really, design is super important, probably more important than people think in the beginning. All these elements of design we're talking about because um, if you practice drawing 
anyone gets better, right? Anyone gets better if you just, if you draw a thousand hands, you will get better drawing a hand. Mm -hmm. But you have to really work at design to get better at design. And usually we're interested in drawing and style. And some people have a natural sense of design and other people kind of never, that's something they really have to take time and apply, right? Mm -hmm. It's usually... I think in the old days when we got in, that's something the editor would talk to you about. That's something that Carmine would lay out stuff for people or John Ramita would go over your cover and go, no, mm. it's better like this, right? So a guy who knew all this stuff we're talking about now would look at your drawing and go, this, you know, this is pretty good. But if you do this, mm -hmm. that's a little uh... bit and what yeah. I find is in most comic, most people that teach comic book classes don't teach enough of this stuff. Mm -hmm. right. They don't yeah. really, because the fact is, if you're teaching a comic book class for the average 12 year old high school student, they would be bored shitless talking about this kind of stuff because they just wanted to know how to draw. Right. Wolverine. Dead, right. Or or Deadpool, Deadpool, right. Whatever, yeah. whatever. Right. They're not interested. But if you're going to be a mature artist, to mature, you have to know this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's it's like it's it's essential. It's essential. I think there was a long time in the '90s where the excitement of drawing in certain styles decoupled us from this kind of thing mm -hmm. that we are kind of recovering from now. Because I see a lot of younger artists who are more interested in the type of things we're talking about tonight. But for a long time. And Brett will tell you, you know, you were at Marvel and DC. They, no, don't worry about that kind of stuff. Just put, smash some shit in people's faces is what they were care. That's all they cared about. Mm -hmm. In fact, if your work was would, would have been too subtle, they wouldn't have liked that. When I was um, kind of absorbing this stuff as a, a young fan. So let's just say, like, I started really getting into comics probably like the mid, 80, like, 86, 87. And um, I couldn't put a name or a face to any of this stuff, but some people just appealed to me in different ways. Um, I think I came in right before the whole sm smash, smash image, everything's exciting, McFarlane universe like that whole era i came in right before that so i saw that i saw that shift it happened quickly in the 80s but i saw it so then when the 90s came um and everything was just kind of like double <laughs> you know sideways double spread double, stuff. <laughs> double stuff spread splash i was just kind of like wow that's a lot and i started to run into younger cartoonists who were who would say yo you're drawing not to me, but just, you know, we're talking about stuff or somebody would show their work. Yo, this needs to be more dynamic, more dynamic. Yo, you should turn the page just on its head and draw it like that. And you need more bullet casings. Slash, yeah. slash, slash so, all the panel orders. Yeah, so like everything just had to be doper, but no one really had a, a, a reason for why that was. So now, like you said, now that we've taken our foot off of the gas visually, here now we're in 2020. There's so many different styles of cartooning. You can see, like when I showed that Young Blood poster to Kari a couple of episodes ago, it looks so dramatically different now because we kind of went through that. It's also very 12 year old male. Yeah, yeah. And I even said, I said to Kari, if I was 12 years old, I think this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Right. <laughs> no, there's, not, right. there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's the one thing I have to say. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is its own thing that lives in its own little little universe. Right, right. Well, I think what happened was that the twelve that that type of twelve year old male was what took over, and that became the predominant desire from right. the companies because that seemed to be popular. But it also excluded anyone who didn't just <laughs> that wasn't their thing, right? So uh, right now, I think because of the influx of female readers, um, you have a wider variety of styles 
than you did 20, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a, that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. Because I think you had a wider variety of styles before that, especially if you go back into the 70s and the 60s. I mean, you had, you know, Richie Rich and, you know, Archie, and then you had Spider-Man, and you had, you know, you had a wide variety of styles of cartooning and different types of stories that became so narrowed and then super narrowed with like that, 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 that gut of, of stuff. Um, and now it's branched back out again. So I think, you know, Saga would not have been popular in the, in the late, the, the, the early nineties, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, you know, or mm -hmm. just like uh, uh, what he's, when he said uh, uh, his, he saw that issue of, uh, well, the new mutants that 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 Mike drew, and it was like, what? Mignola mm -hmm. drew, and like people that that got a lot of hate mail, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like the people who hated Frank Robbins. Now they all love Frank Robbins, but when yeah. you were like twelve, like what the this this bullshit? Then you, I, I, you know, I'll, but the perfect example is I hated Prince Valiant in the comics. <laughs> Did you see Brett Stur Brett turned around? What? <laughs> what? I said good day to you, sir. Hell, Foster, what? I what? Mark Anthony from that Chuck Jones. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I was a kid, I hated Prince Valiant. I was like, why is this strip so big? And they're not doing anything. You know, it's just a dude with a with a bowl haircut, like walking a horse to the left. Why like, is this uh, guy who's got a haircut like Mo? Why does he have a, a whole page? But now I appreciate it. Maybe it's because my palate has changed or I understand sure. the history of cartooning, but I get it now. But it, it did get very quiet, too. Mm -hmm. It was a lot more lively in the first four or five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I wasn't clipping Prince Valiant strips, I'll tell you that. No, no. I, I mean, again, that goes into my point that people take 10, 12 years to mature as artists, right? Because you've got to get, you've got to learn the basics, you got to get in, you got to keep practicing, and then you learn more by doing. I mean, this is one of those jobs that you you don't learn by reading yeah. theory, right? And now we can show you fifty links tonight, all the books to go get. You can go get all those links. You can buy all those books, and then just like <laughs> sit on them, set them right there on your table. I have that Loomis book. I have. I have all I have everything. Yeah. But I'm just waiting for it to just somehow float into my brain. And, uh, 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 you know, you got to put what is it, the 10,000 hours in. Yeah. I had been showing, and I guess we should wrap it up. I think this was nice. But I'm sure there's other things that people want to get to this evening. But on my Instagram last week, um, I've been start I'm starting to get into doing these curated Instagram weeks. I just started. So last week was Hank Ketchum week. Mm. And I was uh, putting a lot of Dennis the Menace. Uh, I have like the little the paperbacks. The, the old paperbacks? Like the, um, the old faucet paperbacks. And that's something that doesn't exist anymore as a thing, right? These right. little things. This was really a big part of me as a kid, like getting uh, into this kind of stuff because you would go to wherever, at a thrift store or whatever, and you just, there'd be boxes of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I was showing a lot of this dinner stuff because I've really been trying to talk to people about the simplicity of Ketchum's line, but also how masterful yeah, all of it is. Yeah, look at that is. table. Again, that's like that Rockwell thing. Look how beautiful that is a design. Yeah. You know, and just, you know, the blacks. And then there's a lot of, he did a lot of texture work in these strips that I think you may have. Oh, look at that. Mm. You what know. a great gesture on her. Oh, yeah. Poor, the poor mother. But you know, it's just like the stuff looks effortless, and you can see the mastery of the of the the nib, right? He's doing like a lot of like broad strokes, just whip, whip, whip. He was a he was a Jalot three hundred three man. Yeah, look at that, and he also didn't close a lot of lines. Like if you look at uh, Dennis's overalls, you see how that line doesn't close around his shoulders. Yeah, he has a lot of, of white is a powerful element of the design. 
in his the negative space um, in his work. Look at that old lady. That's amazing. <laughs> you probably based that on a real old lady, I bet. Yeah. And, you know, for a, a cartoonist who grew up reading, like, I don't know, wet works, like handing them a ah, copy of Did is ah, the Midas, ah, they're going to be like, what, ah, what, what, ah, where's ah, Team 7? What, what are you talking about? But, you know, you can. That actually happened to me at a, at a panel one time. I was, there were people were asking questions. This was back in the 80s. And uh, I was talking about stuff to look at. And I was mentioning not just Ketchum, but the comic books by Al Wiseman. They're fantastic as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, people were kind of laughed and everything. I said, no, no, this guy's fantastic storyteller, staging, all that. And then later, someone who had been at the panel actually came by in the down in the dealer's room, and I was buying old Dennis comics. Mm -hmm. and he said, I thought you were kidding. <laughs> right. <laughs> Like you can't possibly see value in this, but look at that. Yeah. Look at look at the look at the weight of these guys trying to carry this television set. And then like even check out like the I don't know the shadow on these guys' pants. Mm hmm Look at that. Well, you know, he was a Disney guy. He was a Disney guy, and as was as was Walt Kelly. And mm -hmm. you could actually see that in their work. I think uh, I think uh, Ketchum was Warner Brothers. I think was he Warner's? Okay, I thought he was a Disney guy too. I don't know if he ever worked at Disney because he worked with Chuck Jones. Right. Look look at that. Hold on. Oh yeah, beautiful. <laughs> if you can't get something from this, you're not trying. And great attitudes. Yeah. And you know, even talking about the like in the Christmas tree, uh, just sounded in the strip. But also, it's not over rendering, also either. Right, and it's all very, very well designed shapes. You know, that's the thing, is that every shape in there is designed. It's not just tossed in there. Yeah, these are like early strips. Yeah. It's like the first first couple of years of the strip. Dennis has a kind of a more of a troll shaped head there, but yeah. Yeah. This is a uh, 51 and 52. All right, I'll show like one more and then. So what yeah. was his influence on your work, would you say? The biggest influence? Uh, I would just say that this is more of me thinking about how design or even just texture can help a drawing. You know, like, you know, he could have drawn dad's pajamas with polka dots or just dropped the screen tone on that. But there's something very alive and energetic about those stripes. You know, that kind of, you see how it's like attacking the drapery on the on his calf. And I think about Smythe in the Andy Cap strips where I don't have any of that with me where you would see kind of like that uh, old cartooning device of say a guy wearing uh, a plaid suit where you just drop that plaid pattern across the whole thing. Even if an uh, arm is bending, it's still the same kind of. Right. Yeah. Right. It doesn't follow the form. It becomes yeah. design. Yeah. yeah. It's like a design. I think that stuff is really, it's really important. So I think just the design and composition of the stuff really speaks to me. What about his line? Oh, I love it. I love it. And I, the energy. Yeah, I kind of wish that I had learned how to, like, if I started out using a pen, I probably would have a different line. But, you know, look at, look at Margaret. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, it's just, it all works. And just, you know, the thick, thin, the line weight, everything is, it almost feels like he never really used a ruler, but it all works. I also like the organic quality of, that too. I believe he used to ink that stuff on a light box. He'd have like an underdrawing and then he would. Yeah. And then if he didn't like it, he could just like ink it again. I think, I think I have that here. Let me go look. You guys talk amongst yourselves. I have one of those books. Hold on. Did you, did, I think you said that, uh, did you ever buy any Al Wiseman art or you were looking at some once, Brett? Buy any originals? Yeah. Uh, no, I never came across any for sale. I know some people who do have some, but I never saw one. 
I hope you're not waiting for me. He didn't work on a light box. He drew everything in blue pencil. And he had. Yeah, he, did, he did a light box. I have, I think I have it in this. Um, is that the kitchen book? Yeah, this is the Merchant of Dennis. Oh, okay, yes. And I think I scanned this at one point. This is kind of like a, a response to, hey, Mr. Ketchum, how do you draw Dennis the Menace? So I think he even says, like, I think he worked off a of tracing paper. Man, this is hard to do. <laughs> you know, you're so used to operating with a mirror where it's, you know. And I think he talks about a light box in here somewhere. And then he's chasing an airplane. That's a FedEx. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get those strips in. <laughs> But yeah, like all the, oh, there was one last thing I was going to show you. I just saw that was really striking. Look at that. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yep. Master class. All right. <clears throat> so, um, oh, and one last thing, and I don't really think we need to draw anything. I, I think this would be a nice, nice place to stop. But um, Eternity Forever had asked earlier while we were talking about other things, uh, is there a use, in, a use in composing two pages at once or even whole books and layouts to figure out a story's clarity or narrative flow? Uh, we've talked about this before and I can kind of answer that. I feel like when you're laying out a project, it's good, at least for me, to almost think about this like you're in Photoshop and you're zooming out so you're seeing the entire book in one space. There should be a compositional flow to the whole design of a book beyond just the spread, right? Beyond the spread or even page to page, there should probably a, be a communication of design through the whole book. It may be only you that ever sees that or even pays attention to it, but I think it needs to happen. So that could all just start in your thumbnails, right? When you're doing your thumbs and just figuring out, are these things, you know, mirroring each other? Is this good symmetry on, you know, on the left page is this here, but maybe I'll put the next thing on the right page here. Um, I think uh, uh, compositional balance and thinking ahead is a big key to uh, a successful eye flow of a book. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Whenever I always lay the whole thing out first. And now they usually don't interrupt the story with ads, typically. <laughs> right, right. And, I mean, in the old days, you never knew where an ad was going to fall, so it was very hard to think about the facing pages. Uh, but now you can. So you have the first page, obviously, is single, and then after that, you can relate the two. So I, I like to do that as well, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a, another tool you can use. Yeah, I think Hubert used to lay out, too. He would always talk about you went down and then over, right? Mm. And then you turn, right? Because you open the page and you're looking at two pages, right? Yep. And then you turn and you're looking at two pages and you turn and you're looking at two pages. Unless there was an ad. And, of course, I don't think they do that anymore. And he probably knew where the ads would be, you know, kind of a thing. After so, he became an editor, surely. Yeah. Because yeah. Kirby always had those double page splashes in every issue of his of his books so well, in the old days the only place you could do them was the second and third page because that's the only place you knew wasn't going to be broken by an ad right. you knew the first three pages weren't going to have an ad so you could do a spread on the second and third page say really so editorial or was that just common knowledge back then that you yeah. know don't try to do a spread in the in the back half the back nine yeah well yeah they would also have half pages you'd have half pages sometimes Oh, right. I forgot about half. How did, so did editorial, I mean, did they do that in post? You weren't drawing a half page. I think that was, that was over by the 80s, though. I mean, that mm -hmm. was in the late 60s and 70s. They were doing half pages to, to sell ads, more ads. Wow. I forgot about the half page. Yeah. I think did, more so, in DC than Marvel, too, for some reason. So was that ever a thing where guys would not know until they saw the book on the spinner rack? That they that they totally chop your page in half. No, I think they knew. I think they, they knew. drawn that way. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I thought that was like a 
po a post production type thing. So sorry, Kirby, cutting right across your page. There we go. Uh, <laughs> putting an ad for a giant submarine right there. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I you know, obviously, we wouldn't do this stuff if it wasn't important and also interesting to us. Uh, one thing that I like to tell people, because once in a while, you guys, I get a lot of um, comments from people or you know, some some well wishing about the podcast and about how you suck. Why are you more exciting? No, it's usually like, oh man, Brett Blevins. <laughs> That's what most of them. I've have. never seen him before. <laughs> oh man, Brett Blevins. I love Brett Blevins. I'm kind of reclusive, I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and sometimes it's kind of like I think people, I think people know, but I think people forget the the breadth of knowledge that you guys have because we're always having guests on right so it's easy to slip into a thing that we're just like talking heads to interview people you know but the the cool part about this and what i said earlier in the podcast i'm just a talking head i have no arms or anything about uh the fly on the wall style of us talking is like this is what shop talk sounds like you know and especially to you guys and me obviously you're still students mm. after decades decades into your career you're still you still get the jimmies looking at a rockwell book oh yeah <laughs> you know what i mean or especially when you discover something new that you didn't know about before that's always the thrill right right and yeah. i th i think that's important as a maturing i like the way mike says maturing um maturing artist that you don't kind of <laughs> figure yeah. it out when you're done yeah, 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 yeah. please continue there was a, a old, not old, but it was an old commercial kind of like in the early thousands where this guy's sitting at his uh, little din computer table and he's typing and he like hits a button and lays back and goes, ah, finished. And his wife comes over and goes, honey, what are you talking about? What are you finished? The internet. I see it all. <laughs> I remember that commercial. <laughs> so... I think some people would be surprised to hear that you guys are still excited about learning yeah. things about the art form or discovering things that you may have missed. And drawing and you yeah. know, all the parts. Of it. I just recently found out about this guy that I've now loved called Charles Keeping. Oh, wow. Look at That's that. Fantastic. He's a British illustrator. Is that graphite, Brett? Or is that? Uh, I think it's ink, but he smears it. Oh. With a, with a, you know, like a like a cotton ball or something. Wow, that's beautiful it's a scary story. But isn't that great design? Yeah. That's beautiful. He does a lot of ink uh, washes. Oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah, this is from uh, the tale of Sir Gawain. Ooh. Just hanging out in Brett's studio is a masterclass. It's a lot of great stuff here. I have to say, I was going to show this earlier, forgetting how what it was in reference to. But I, it's taken me a long time to track a bunch of this stuff down, but I keep finding these marvelous old Ronald Searle books. Oh, look at that! And now it's all kind of like a content, continuous line. Oh yeah, and he draws right through. Sometimes, I mean, his yeah. whole thing was he he valued above everything else spontaneity. So. Mm -hmm. if he, uh, did something and it didn't quite have the energy that he wanted. He'd just start over until he got the one, you know, he drew, he often, some, this is, I think most of this book is nibs. Mm. It looks like, but um, he would also draw with like a, one of those carved wooden. Oh, wow. Yeah. You get certain kinds of quality. Yeah. There's so much wonderful energy in it. And one of, one of the things I love about him is he's reached a point with his freedom that he's not bound by any kind of, mm super careful construction or anything he's really going for mood and character look at the weight in that figure yeah it's just gorgeous good. and the delicate violin like against yeah. this massive wow and there's a yeah i love the way he does crowd scenes this is a book about just his travels around london and cool stuff that he saw there uh -huh. uh, this is a place with all these uh pull, pull i guess chicken carcasses you could buy I don't oh know. wow very well that's really cool, Brett. And this is awesome, too. Look at that. We're going to change the name of the show, too. That's really cool, Brett. 
Well, what I should do is scan some of this stuff and have it ready in some way to. Uh, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I know. I look at this stuff and it just makes me want to draw. Yeah. And that's the name of the game. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, let's start wrapping it up. So uh, well, this I, I wanted to go over one oh, more thing, sure just Mike. so everybody can write this down. Sure, Mike. Um, what you, what you got? So the elements of composition is what we were talking about tonight, right? Yes. So you have line, mm -hmm. shape, space, right? The space you're going to be in, right? Mm -hmm. The size of things, right? Value. Value is more important than color. You can just have a drawing with value and never have color. Then texture. Mm. And so you're always working with those, like those, uh, what, uh, one, two, three, four, five, seven. You're always working with those seven elements. Mm -hmm. But you don't start working until you put a border around it. Right? Mm -hmm. So you try to learn these things in the beginning. It's like good habits. Everybody has good habits and bad habits. And what you know, try to do when you're young is get rid of the bad habits Right. So whether you I tell people, you know, you take a piece of tape and you write borders and you stick that up. What whatever it is that you're fighting, whatever that particular problem is you're trying to lick, then you're sort of aware of it. But um if you work really hard for the first four or five years, mm -hmm. you get you'll get this stuff down. And then that frees your mind to be Ronald Searle to ex start exploring things like that, right? Because if you don't, what happens is you always get tripped up. It's a, you put a lot of work into something, and at the very end, you go, shit. <laughs> that, that, I totally blew that. I totally forgot that. Or that's totally not working. Or you'll get frustrated mm -hmm. after putting a lot of work in and not want to dig that ditch over again. Yeah, you don't want to fix it. Yeah. yeah. That is also a step that you have that you go through less if you concentrate on these things in the beginning. And I went through a lot of ditch digging when I was younger because I didn't have a teacher who taught this stuff. I would like I would find a book like the Loomis book or something or the mm -hmm. Illusion of Life book or something. Ah, right. But those books are dense. So you're not going to, if you went out today and you bought the Illusion of Life book, you're going to be reading that book three years, four years down the road. You're not going to be able to absorb uh, all the information. Right. Right. That's Disney. You're not going to absorb Disney speed reading in an hour. Yeah. You know, you're not going to take a speed reading course and go, no, I know Disney. Right. I, I know uh, Kung Fu. What also happens is when you build up a library of these things and then you start doing your own work and you've got projects, you'll, if you keep, if you know, if you look at them a lot in your downtime and you're just thinking about it all the time, you'll come against a problem and that will trigger a memory of something in one of these books. When you go to one of these source uh, texts with a problem in mind, then you can really get it that time because it's really pertinent to the problem you're trying to solve. And then it sticks in your mind better than any of the times prior. Yeah. It's yeah. good to have, you don't have to have a huge library, but things that inspire you and things that have the technical knowledge in them. I think. Yeah. Uh, it's my, just like, uh, go ahead, Mike. usually a couple times a year I go out, I was going to say a couple times a year as I go out to the Brandywine and I look at the, uh, the Wyatt's pile and the Wyatt's. And every time I go, and I've been going there for 30 years. Every time I go, I learn something or I see something that I didn't see before. And like the more I learn as an artist, the more I'm able to learn from another artist. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I went back to school to be a painter, I learned more about painting. Therefore, when I go look at people who are painters, I understand more about how they achieve their work. Right. And so these elements we're talking about are in the work of everyone that you admire. So when you learn them, then, you, ah, I know what Toth does as opposed to what Jim Lee does, as opposed to what Chuck Jones does, or I know why I like what they do, and I know what that is, and now I can try to put that in my work. It's not like, hmm, I like it, but I have no idea why. 
Mm -hmm. Right. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why. I just, right. No more Apple Jacks. <laughs> Apple Jacks is over. <laughs> I like that. And pencil to pencil, no more. All Apple Jacks out of your hand. P2P, no more Apple Jacks. That's right. Um, all right. So I was going to pull up our... Um, Oh, did you disconnect yourself? He must have. Did he disconnect? Did he go down? Man down? Well, will he be able to come back, do you think? Yeah, he'll be able to come back. Yeah. This happened earlier. But uh, um, so what have you been working on, Brett? Uh, well, I haven't been in the studio here for a couple of days, but I'm working on the uh, inking. Uh, there you are. Sorry, go ahead, Brett. I pressed the wrong button. Mike just asked me what I was working on, and I've got a couple of these indie things that I'm uh, getting parts done of. So, um, yeah, yeah, I was always going to ask Brett what he's doing right now. Everybody's always interested to see what's on your table. Well, I have the after the aftershock project is underway. I'm working on the third inking the third issue of that, but I have um, these other two things too. So it's, I'm always busy with something. Um, I, I was interested if I could, I don't know if this will even work. Sure. What are you if trying I to do? show you something to share my screen? Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead. How do okay. I do that? Uh, there should be a button at the bottom that says share screen. Okay. When I'm you, just going to leave you with some more inspirations if I. So when you click on that, it's going to ask you what exactly are you trying to share? And you click on that. Then you have to you click can... on, right. It could be the entire desktop or something in your browser. All right. Uh, I thought I did it, but now I don't. Is it showing up? No? I see it, but it's your whole desktop. Is that what you want to show? Well, is it got a picture in the middle of it? Because I can't make this any bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. You, you can see, see it? it? Yeah. Okay. This guy is just absolutely amazing. And uh, who, who's his this? name? Edward Theoni. He's a, he was a German who worked right through both world wars, but he worked for mainly his whole life. He became one of the editors for Simplicissimus, German humor magazine. But if you want to see about this pure design, and because of the printing limitations, they had very limited color. Mm. Um, but just I'll just run through a few of these, and you can just see how amazingly designed they are. Wow. It took me several months to download this stuff because he worked for the magazine from 1894 until he died in 44, I think. Wow. Uh, somewhere in there. Look at that one. Um, <laughs> and uh, he... Uh, there's a museum in Germany that has put up every issue of the magazine wow. and with nice scans and they have every page and they, you can search by topic, including individual artists. So it took me months to download this, but I downloaded like 50 years of his work. Wow. And as you can see, I mean, look at the black pattern in that. Uh, look at that. And, and how how is this reproduced? I mean, I know it's a like a yeah, it's very movie. crude. It's on, it was on uh, I I don't know if it was actually on newsprint, maybe something a little higher quality. Mm -hmm. uh, but they had very limited printing, as you can see. They couldn't use full color. So look how beautifully he uses yeah, these. Just like one color. Yeah, and you know the design of this stuff. This is one of the things that if I'm ever having any bit of sluggishness, I just have to start spooling through this stuff, and it inspires me as if I was a kid again. Wow, that's how he the shadows on the faces of these guys. <laughs> that's, so, that's so great. Tim yeah. Fielder says, Brett, uh, Brett, this reminds him of Kyle Baker's work. Oh, yeah, it has that, yeah. It has that expression and freedom. Yeah, I don't think Kyle Baker is a Nazi, though. No, I, I don't think so. <laughs> and I, I don't know that this guy was either, he wasn't sympathetic. But he did survive, so he wasn't, you know, a lot of the cartoons are making fun of the stuff. But I notice in World War I, he's merciless to all the commanders and everything. Mm. But he doesn't really make fun of Hitler, so he probably knew enough. Like, not yeah, to not to cross that line. Right? But uh, look, at, look at how beautifully that is, that background so simple. But, I mean, the color, uh, uh, the simplicity of the color is very effective as well. Oh, I like that one a lot. Well, but what you're really seeing is you're seeing design, you're seeing line, yeah. shape, value. Right? And because as Mike says, as you can see, how important it is the way it relates to the borders. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Because these are just random. I just uh, threw a bunch of these together just to sort of, you know, flip through. Look at that nice spatter effect there. Look at that beautiful thing. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, mm. And this is like a great example of how negative space can enhance an image. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, Not, I, right. I can tell you one comic artist who everybody knows who just absolutely loves this guy is Mignola. So there's no mm -hmm. surprise there. So. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, he works, you know, like the plane is almost like he's, like Mike was saying, you're, you're working with uh, maybe people today wouldn't even remember what color forms were. Yeah. You could move yeah. the figures around and uh, just, you know, they remain, they retain, retain the integrity of their silhouette, but you could make different compositions with them. <laughs> I love color form. Yeah. Uh, uh, Brett, Tim, uh, Tim, Tim asks, where can you find this stuff? I know you just scanned a bunch of it. So. Uh, ooh, that's tricky. I would have to figure out where um, that site is, but I could find that for maybe you could put it on the. Yeah, we'll put. I could put it on the web page later. Yeah, it's uh, and it's incredibly easy to navigate because it. I didn't know this at first. I started at the earliest issues, and then, I don't know. I was maybe, who God knows how many, maybe a month into it when I suddenly realized there was a button to translate it into English. <laughs> Not the actual scans of the pages, but the site so that you can navigate it. And that made a big, big difference. That's awesome. But you have to download them one image at a time. Uh, so it takes a long. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> Brett just got kicked. Maybe he'll be, he'll be back. Um, so I want to talk about uh, our Wednesday guest. Mike, you still alive? I am. Okay. Hey, I didn't see you moving there. <laughs> We've had a lot of weird technical difficulties tonight, but I think yeah, well, it's it's raining and, yeah. and and we always have at least one or two quits every stream yard. Just like nah, <laughs> nah, <Slap>. son. <laughs> uh, so Wednesday we'll be back with our next guest, uh, Danielle Corsetto. Danielle is a fantastic cartoonist who uh, may be known to you as the cartoonist behind Girls with Slingshots a uh, fantastic uh, a comic that she did for a while, uh, which she just finished a little while ago and uh, got collected. Oh, and how is this for uh, a corollary? Uh, Danielle did a very successful Kickstarter for Girls with Slingshot and Spike published this. Spike, who we had on last, uh, uh, last Wednesday. Hold on, I'm gonna show you this book. I had to, I had to cop it, hold on. <clears throat> Talk about big, big bubbas. Wow. Hold on, I'm going to show you this. This is the complete collective of uh, girls with slingshots. Wow. <clears throat> so, and this is Gosh, from. That's got to be what, three, four, five hundred pages? Something like that. And there's two volumes in here. And this is from Spike's Iron Circus Comics Publishing. Look at that. Mm. So, yeah, Danielle is, is fantastic, and I can't wait to talk to her on Wednesday. So uh, one thing I enjoy about our little podcast that could is that we keep it mixed up with a nice selection of cartoonists and animators and creatives from around the field. And it's just not not like the same old four people every every uh, episode. We keep it really um, we keep it moving here, pencil to pencil. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, any last words for you guys for tonight before we wrap up the show? Draw, go and draw something. Draw <laughs> every day. Draw like you draw like it's the antidote. Draw like. <laughs> Given a shot that's going to kill you, the only thing that'll save you is drawing. <laughs> I like it. No pressure, right? Also, uh, draw with shapes. You know, I used to actually do that when I was laying out things. If you work with something like, uh, I used to have a carpenter's pencil, those chisel tips. Yeah. So you literally cannot draw any detail. So you're forced to just work on the shape. And I'm just talking mm -hmm. about roughs, you know. And it really did help. It helped a lot. Oh, uh, wow. Because if you're using a, a, de a delicate tool, then you can immediately start working on worrying about eyelashes and things like that. But if you're drawing with this big chunk, 
it forces you to make sure your shapes read. Oh, that's that's great advice. My advice for tonight is to lift heavy bo art books. Mm. <laughs> Get hernias. That's Get right. Hernia. Get your weight up. Get your art hernia. Right. <laughs> All right, you guys, this has been another Pencil to Pencil. Uh, thank you guys for joining in. This was a uh, comic art boot camp. I think we learned a lot. Everybody who was watching live uh, was commenting on how much fun this was. And there's always something to learn when you're hanging out with the fellas, the boys of summer. You heard it here first. So we'll see you back on Wednesday. Uh, for Brett and Mike, I'm Jamar Nicholas. Uh, remember, you guys, wash your, wash your hands and then curvy hands. Go ahead, Brett. You got to do it. Oh, mine are a mask or uh, have a, I got a glove on this one. Oh, Good night, guys.